republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, our first item, as always, is public audience. Is there anyone who'd like to address the Board of Selectmen? Yes. Yeah. Joan Poe, 26 Whitcomb Drive. At the last Board of Selectmen meeting, a resident was concerned that the condition of memorial pool facility. After hearing his concerns, I went to the pool house and saw a building in total disrepair. The kiddie pool was slippery with children falling. According to town staff, there were no accident reports generated. Why? The health department did an inspection on August 8th and found that the pool was slippery and mold was present on the shower curtains, shower stalls, and these are the pictures of what I saw. Faucets were not clean. Many people were using the pool under these unclean conditions. The sink had a pail under it to collect leaks. The bathrooms were in disrepair and the ceiling tiles were open and vents full of debris. Several years ago, there was discussion about closing the memorial pool and just use the Simsbury Farms pool to reduce costs. With a $235,000 deficit year after year, it is time this board votes to close the memorial pool. First Selectman Mary Glassman continues to say that nobody complained about the facility. Why should the town residents alert the town to poor maintenance? Where is the town's oversight of town facilities? We pay, you do your job. I am concerned that Tom Cook, the town pseudo town manager, has not been able to finalize the police union contract. How can Tom Cook ask the police union to negotiate in good faith when he gave himself a $10,000 increase in salary, bringing his present salary to $114,000? Tom Cook had a starting salary of 104508 What are the legacy costs associated with his employment? It appears that the Simsbury Police Department is securing car seats for several police departments in the area. In order to secure the car seats effectively, it takes a lot of pushing and pulling, causing strain on the body. This could cause bodily injury. Why can't all police departments certify their police officers in car seat installation. <coughs> Recently, there were five residents evicted from Eno Farms. According to the judicial records, Eno Farms had 11 evictions over the years, with many residents leaving because they couldn't afford the rent. According to the town's ground lease, the property is for low and very low income residents, as stated in the Eno Trust. However, According to the CHFA website, 48 units at Eno Farms has designated the rental units with income as percent of area median income. There are 27 units with low and very low income. Eight units have 25% of the median income, which is very low income. Then 19 units are between 25 and 50%, and that's low income. Of the media, there are 15 units between 51% and 80%, which is moderate income, and six units above the moderate income. According to this posting, there are 21 units above the low and very low income levels. What has the town done, along, along with CHFA, done to maintain a facility for the poor? The rents are high, and the income levels are above the levels to comply with the ground lease and the Eno Trust. Why has First Selectman Mary Glassman abdicated her responsibility to care for the poor residents at Eno Farms? I would like to report that Dave Richmond, owner of the office building at 730 Hop Meadow Street, has completed the handicap rank to his building and has received a letter from the town that he had 210 days in violation of the zoning regulations and must pay $31,000 in fines. According to town records from November 4th, 2011 to August 4th, 2014, there have been approximately 183 foreclosures. This is a reflection of the economy and the need for increased social services. Recently, the town established a committee for community care with elected and appointed individuals to reach out to the community where there is intervention and suicide, suicide and addiction. According to town records, there are many, many residents in need of intervention. It is alleged that many of the arrests for larceny, credit card theft, and burglary are associated with the use of narcotics. 
According to town residents, one resident was arrested around 10 times for larceny and other offenses. Another resident was recently arrested for narcotics with traces of marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. Larceny and credit card theft. He was arrested five times. Another resident was arrested for larceny and credit card theft five, five times. Another resident was arrested for possession of drug paraphernalia and narcotics with traces of marijuana, cocaine, and heroin recently. Another recent arrest, a resident was arrested for burglary. The town should not ignore the fact that Schedule One drugs such as marijuana, cocaine, and heroin are present in our neighborhood. Has Selectman Heavener reached out to these families as a member of the community for care? I would ask this board to reject the fees imposed on walk-ons on the paddle courts during open time. Taxpayers support the maintenance of paddle courts as they do tennis courts and fields. Why should walk-ons be charged a fee for this venue when no fees are imposed for other venues? It is an inconsistent policy since many times the office is closed so no fees can be collected. Other times, employees rush out of the office to collect the fees. If Simsbury is to be a community-friendly community town, why accost people who are using the facilities that are paid for with their tax dollars? I recently received a phone call alerting that Joe Grace is once again participating in a coaching capacity with the Simsbury football team. In 1999, there were many parents who signed a letter to uh, Superintendent Dr. Townsley describing the actions of Coach Grace hitting four players during halftime during the Bloomfield game, where Simsbury was losing by a large margin. The parents' letters were ignored until students from the high school newspaper asked to write a story about Coach Grace hitting the players. The administration told students not to write the story, and when written, the newspaper was disbanded and the students removed. According to an article in the Hartford Current, June 10, 1999, Aaron Pomerantz was quoted as saying, during any, quote, any time kind of uh, intense attacks match, during any kind of intense athletic match, coaches will take upon themselves to increase the adrenaline of their players. For some coaches, that results in spirited speeches aimed at firing up the team for others. It means physical jousting. Coach Grace does both. If you could summarize, Ms. Coach, yeah, in seven minutes. More. Why has Principal <clears throat> Neil Sullivan allowed Joe Grace to coach the team with this past history? Coaching football is not exempt from appropriate conduct. Coach hits kids, coach is gone. I am still awaiting the opinion of the town attorney after his exhaustive research on whether medical building 33 Canal Street, where Representative John Hapton is living, is a legal use of the property. Thank, Thank you for you. listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll put my stuff on www.simsbury.com and you. also the Simsbury patch. Anyone else? In case like you to... missed something. Yes, sir. Robert Kalishman, Simsbury. Thank you for allowing me to uh, address the, uh, the board for selection. And uh, before I start, I, uh, the finance director gave me the courtesy of preparing what we've paid for attorneys over the last year, maybe the last two years. I looked at it, and I, like, gulped. And I, th I think I'm low in the figure, but some of the figures I see here, $8 million. $60,000. But the, the purpose of it is, I just want to point out, we have a town, a town attorney. He has a contract. And it seems to me he should make a choice. Either he wants to belong, serve the town, or he wants to serve up Dyke Kelly and, and Spellacy. It's as plain as simple as that. And any, any uh, accountant will tell you that if you're going to go out and hire these private attorneys, you're better off going out 
and uh, hiring a full-time attorney, 24-hour attorney, that will be at your beck and call 24 hours a day. But I, I'm not here to address that. I just want to point that out to you. Spending a lot of money. And what initiated it, of course, was this uh, Houlihan, who I feel Chip Houlihan is a political uh, operative, and I feel this is political payoff. That he's be, he was paid $60,000 to Ethel Walker, then he was paid $3,700 for a sidewalk easement. That's not right. You want to serve the town, fine. But don't expect something in return, and that's what's being done here. Well, let me start my streetlights need for the first selectment found millions of dollars for study. What I mean here is we've done charrette after charrette after charrette. And we need street lights, we need sidewalks. These street lights are from, are from the 60s. And the reason for them is they're not meant to light. What they're, they're meant for is, is for low cost. And that's what they're up there for. They're outdated, they're obsolete, and when it was requested to do a study, that's all we got from the board via the first selectman was a little lot of giggles and we really can't afford to spend that kind of money, but we can go out and we can do charrette after charrette after charrette, and I'll bet you that's gone over millions of dollars. And we, we need street lights and we need sidewalks if we're gonna be a town that's going to stand up. Now, the second thing we went wrong, we discussed that the, the budget, the police talk about the police budget that had many proposed cuts and no new police cars in the new budget. When that budget, this budget that you approved was, appro was, was appropriated and approved, right? The police budget originally was to be cut. There were no police cars in there. And the police car, or police cars were restored, but we never restored the police positions. But at the meeting, it was saying, we filled all the police positions, we have no more police positions to fill, and that was misleading at best. Because we never filled the, the two police positions that were asked for by me and the community were never achieved. It was done with smoke and mirrors. You have a situation at the school where the Board of Education and the town covers a policeman in the schools. But we have nobody, we don't have the two additional policemen to cover the marijuana factory which we now have and which will be producing marijuana either at the end of this month or the beginning of next month. And that, is that something to be proud of? We cut our policemen but we went out and we now have a marijuana factory over. And why was it done? In my opinion, because Ensign Bickford was the, was the master. They wanted that property sold and they wanted, and they sold it. And the people they sold it to was a felon. He's in prison now, federal prison. That's no secret either. And I still haven't, we still haven't had the investigation as to why that building is down there. It's being, it's, you're hiding it from us for some reason. Okay, those are uniformed policemen. Okay, special counsel lawyer for Ethel Walker. This is what I'm talking about. Last time that the Updike Kelly Spellacy had to recluse themselves, it cost the town $60,000 for Mr. Houlihan to represent the town and Ethel Walker. This time, you pass the bill, I sat here, you pass the budget or the amount of money to be paid Mr. Houlihan this time, Esquire, you don't even know what, it, what the cost was. When somebody from the board had the audacity as far as the first select woman was concerned to ask what the amount was, Everything was done with smoke and mirrors. Well, I know what it's next year. I'll do it this year. I'll you, ne you still don't have a figure of what you're going to pay Mr. Houlihan this year. And you're remiss in your duties if you sit here and you pass ordinances and you pass <coughs> bills to pay people. You don't even know what you're paying them. That's not good government. But you did it. 
is a political, okay. If you could Knowing summarize, Mr. Couch, it's been five minutes. Yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll be, I'm Seven finishing minutes. up now. This is a political payoff. In other words, it's, it's political payola for the Democratic Party. Now, let's get to just another example of the special treatment. Let's get to the solo panels that are up on that ice skating center. Let's get to that special treatment, right? Rightly so, the first select woman, she reclused herself. I don't know why she didn't tell us why she reclused herself, but she reclused herself. She doesn't want you to know why she reclused herself. I'll let her tell you. Okay, the treatment. And just another example of the special treatment that we're giving this fella. If you put solar panels on your house, or you put solar panels on your house already, you were assessed for the panels on the roof. That's what you call home improvement. They put panels on the thing, now they're coming, and through the town administration, who does all the talking for the first select woman, they're asking for a tax abatement. They want all these members to vote for a tax abatement. And here again, it's special treatment. And who's the special treatment for? It's for special persons that are well connected to the Democratic Party. It's no secret. Can you sum Democratic some, Party. Okay. Mr. Cashman, that your and time I'm is up. I'm going to sum up. And let me Thank sum you. it up this way. When I was a youngster, <laughs> there were many judges that were well connected to the parties. I knew it. I sat in the room. Young, I was a young fellow with my dad, and I know what, what went on with and these were judges. So you're getting special treatment for the political parties, but the honest citizen that pays the taxes, he's not getting any breaks, he's not getting any special treatment. So in closing, let me say this. The Drug Enforcement Agency, the chief, says that marijuana is the worst thing for Connecticut, and it's the worst thing that ever happened to Simsbury. Thank you, Mr. Callison. Anyone else who'd like to address the board? Thank you all the for the comments. Thing is, uh, we're right, going to move on now. Opponent, no, we're going to move on. Mr. Couchman, and we're going to move on. No, I'm going to have to rule you out of order. Have me arrested. I, no, I, we need, we have other people who are, already. Mr. Couchman, we have other people who have no, given you eight, 10 out. minutes. tried to arrest people two or ten three minutes. times already ten minutes. for speaking I'm happy out. to give you more time at the end, but we have Should business to do. Please. Thank you, Mr. Couchman. We have more uh, business to do, and there are other people that are waiting for the agenda. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Kalishman. Um, I'd like to now move on to the presentations. We have folks waiting to uh, present to the Board of Selectmen on the Simsbury Celebrates Committee. Uh, we are uh, <coughs> going to call on Janet Calabro and um, Carol Brown, who are here, to uh, make a special presentation and an update on this wonderful um, program that you bring to Simsbury every Thanksgiving. So welcome, and thank you thank for you being Mary. here. Thank you to the Board. Uh, my name is Janet Calabro, for those of you who aren't aware, and I join my colleagues tonight, Carol Brown and Paulette Clark from the Committee of Simsbury Celebrates. Uh, the committee members and I are thrilled to share with you our primary fundraiser for 2014, a signed limited edition Glisse print painted by Simsbury's own Catherine Elliott, especially for Simsbury Celebrates. We commissioned Catherine ah. to paint a scene that represented the essence of Simsbury <laughs> and would have meaning to all residents. The painting was reproduced under Catherine's artist eye on artisanal paper using special inks by Rich Wagner of Imagined It Framed. And we're thrilled to announce that the entire first print run sold out in three months. These prints are not available anywhere except from Simsbury Celebrates and were very well received by the community. At this time, the prints are only available by special prepaid order from Taryn at Simsbury Farms until the capped print run is reached. The original oil was sold immediately upon, upon completion to one of our committee members. It's with great pleasure that as a committee, we're here tonight to present this framed edition of the Celebrate Our View print to the town of Simsbury in recognition oh. for the support we receive from the town each year as we plan Simsbury Celebrates. It's our hope that the Board of Selectmen will display this treasure prominently for all Simsbury residents to admire when visiting Town Hall. Thank you to the Board of Selectmen and to the various departments within the town especially, first and foremost, the Simsbury Volunteer Fire Department, the Board of Parks and Recreation, Simsbury Public Works, and the Simsbury Police Department for their dedication and assistance year after year. A special and heartfelt thanks to Catherine Elliott and Rich Wagner for their incredible support and talent. 
Mary, would you and the board please accept this gift to the residents of the town of Simsbury on behalf of the Simsbury Celebrates Thank Committee. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Carol, and the whole committee, Colette. Very much. It's really it's beautiful. Really pretty. Um, and thank you to uh, all of you for bringing Simsbury Celebrates to Simsbury. It's I don't know if uh, everyone knows that it's a completely volunteer-run organization, and uh, thousands of people come out every year. And uh, you guys do a great job. And we couldn't mm -hmm. we couldn't do it without you. It just wouldn't happen. So um, I know you're looking for donations. So <laughs> where would you like our donations sent? Um, actually, here in the town, you can just leave them with the Parks and Rec Department. Great. Which, let me clarify: the Parks and Rec Department does not support it. Just the intake of the money. Okay. Um, or you can send them to PO Box 495, and they get put in a separate fund. That all the money goes right back to Center for Celebrates. And before someone asks, Catherine did this for free for us, oh. and uh, Rich donated his time, basically at cost, and we were able to make enough money to pay. So great. Really well, the, Catherine and Rich are great um, yeah. residents, great artists, and uh, we'll display it proudly in uh, a town hall. We're actually uh, repainting the main meeting room, so we'll we'll bring it back um, after the room is painted. So it'll be great. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Maybe Catherine will come out and help us. So thank you. We're very uh, honored to have you here. So uh, we'll move on now to the next update. Um, I think we. We're actually going to do the generator as part of our action item, so maybe what we'll do. Um, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, Sorry, guys. Go tell Did you go to that? Don't be pressured. No. Office till 6 Office on the Come on, you I'm going to fall this I'm going to fall this I'm Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll do, um, if I could ask the board, uh, we could do the generator update when, at the first item of our agenda. I know um, we have two other updates. One is from Jeff on the GIS system. And then I was going to ask the board if they would um, move, amend the agenda to take up the economic development update so that Hiram could, wouldn't Go have ahead. to stay for the whole yeah. meeting. So <laughs> he, He's standing there. Uh, don't vote for him if you don't want him. <laughs> he's, uh, so um, if I could have a motion to amend the agenda and just move up the presentation to the presentation section. Um, I appreciate it. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. Aye. Great. So go ahead, Jeff. If you want to do, we'll do the generator update after the first item of business. So if you want to hold off on that oh, one, sure. just do the GIS update. Sure. And okay. then we'll come back to the generator. Um, on the GIS update, uh, the various departments that are involved with GIS have been working diligently over the last six months to try to bring the, the system into a state of, of I guess, uh, that we can release and we feel comfortable with. Um, what we've been focusing on uh, is basically scrubbing the data, getting it as accurate as possible so when it's released, we hopefully have a good result and a good response uh, from the public. Uh, relative to, to the information that's provided. We're also continuing to build other layers uh, that we feel are important for our day-to-day -day business, uh, be it the storm drainage uh, that would be very valuable to the Public Works Department during storm events, um, trying to assess condition and location of various structures. Uh, we're developing a sidewalk inventory that's not quite done yet, um, which we think will be important just to see the big picture the connectivity and all that kind of thing relative to schools and the center of the town here. Um, we're also working on a real significant project for us internally, which is scanning our record zoning uh, record maps, which shows all the site plans, all our as-built drawings for past engineering projects to make it, again, very accessible and available to the internal customers, not necessarily the, the, the public. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to determine what uh, information we should release and what we shouldn't release and actually we're down to the wire on that but certainly by October 1 we feel confident that we can you know uh, release this hopefully get some feedback from the public determine what's priority in terms of building additional data sets 
and um, you know move forward with it. Uh, it's you know we have limited limited time to work on it, frankly, um, but staff and uh, department has been real. Uh, Real uh, involved and you know responsive to, to actually working on the system, so we feel it's going to be a useful tool. It's been a lot of work done, as we had said over the last ten years. It just hasn't really been available, and uh, we're really shooting right now to release it on October one. So that's really where we are. And thanks, sure Jeff. Take any questions. It was important to bring it uh, to the board's attention because we have. Um, work to have a GI system that's used internally, which makes the uh, review of documents and a review of business applications, but we've been focusing uh, with the Economic Development Commission to really bring this and make this available to the public. And so uh, before we did that, we wanted to make sure that the information was up to date and was easily accessible. And um, since Jeff's come on board, he's really been focusing on uh, getting it ready to release to the public. So congratulations to you. Thanks. And you'll let us know um, what you need in terms of moving forward once uh, we make it available. I will. Great. Lisa. Um, first of all, I want to <coughs> congratulate you and thank you because um, this was, you came in, took over a system that was partially there and partially not really took grabbed hold of it and made this happen. There were lots of pieces in motion, but it took you to bring it together, and we appreciate all the work you did. You gave an excellent presentation along with our vendor to the technology committee, which really opened my eyes and I think Tom's eyes as to what the possibilities were and, and the potential for not only public safety but economic development. So I want to thank you for that. One of the things the technology committee highlighted, I know it's not really exciting, but it's so important, and they really gave a huge shout out to you for um, implementing workflow procedure for changes in parcel lines because our the GIS will only be as good as the data is, and that's why it's so important that you have procedures for changes orders and who owns the data and that was a crucial piece that was missing and Jeff has just done a phenomenal job taking hold of that procedure process and I know you know the press it's not something you write about but it's, but it's <laughs> crucial and it's essential and you have done an excellent job and I want to thank you for expediting the process you really taken a complicated um, system and gotten it ready to roll out in a remarkably short time and I just want to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work that took on your part and how impressed um, the technology committee and I am and all you've done. I want to thank you publicly for that. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Right. We'll move on. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're uh, also do a, an update on the Economic Development Commission. Hiram's here. Uh, we'll get back to you. Um, and one of the things that I just want to report when we, um, our finance directors, is here and he has been doing a great job of uh, summarizing our year end and we recently in reporting to the Board of Finance uh, one of the reports was that the building permit line item on the revenue side is up $149,000 um, and you know oftentimes in doing budgets we focus on the expenditure side and the shortfalls but we don't often look at the revenue side and uh, what is very significant is we have hundred and fifty thousand dollars of revenue that we did not uh, budget for because of um, the um, imp improvement in our economic development efforts and Hiram's efforts to expedite the programs and the processes. And um, I thought it was important to update, um, not only did we update the Board of Finance, but we thought it was important to update the Board of Selectmen that the additional revenue, 150000 is made up for a number of uh, reasons. So we thought it would be important for Hiram tonight to talk about the uh, significant improvements. So Hiram, thanks for being here. Sure. Um, I just want to, before I start, I just wanted to just add one note to what Jeff said, too, that the maintenance of that material is critical. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I know that the Board of Finance every year will say, well, what's this for, what's this for? But unless you, once you generate the material, if you don't maintain it, it's really not worth much. Exactly. So thank you. Um, just to, I, you all have, I think, a copy of the, of the uh, short memo that I wrote on September 4th, just talking a little bit about the economic development. Uh, improvements or the the receipt really of, of building permit improvements uh, we also expect by the way that that's not really the end of it for this year right. we fully expect that um, and this just goes to the second item I was going to address is that uh, big Y will be in uh, in September uh, I have their final plans on my desk now and they're being reviewed um, I suspect they'll probably close and break ground in September that'll be no small piece of change for that particular permit either um, I did a started to prepare um, for a talk that I was asked to give tomorrow to the retired men's luncheon. And uh, it turns out that as I started to go through the projects that we're currently working on, there are about 15 projects that are really live right now. And those are all different types of things. Uh, and they really go from the north end of town, North Village to town center 
to what I call now the South Village or the South End of Town. So there are about 15 projects that are actually live. So you have the numbers in front of you. Uh, I think that it really comes from a variety of things. I think that um, the Zoning Commission, Planning Commission with regard to subdivisions, Design Review Board have all begun to work, not begun, but have continued to work um, well together. Uh, somebody did say to me recently that, that they thought that uh, zoning approves everything. I just wanted to point out, not every dumb idea gets in front of one of the commissions. And so my job as filter is to tell the people that um, that, that idea is not going to fly. And so I hope that, it, that it's not really widely thought out there that everything gets approved. Things that do get to the commissions, that do make it through the process and do get properly reviewed, do have a chance of, of getting approved. So I just wanted to, to let folks know that in, in all due respect to those folks. I'm open to any questions that you might have on anything that I wrote. We continue to work hard to get the building department, the code enforcement folks, and the plan review people to all work together, which is critical. I think we have had, um, as far as I know, no complaints whatsoever from the building department, um, which is, is really a lot different than a lot of other towns around the state that, uh, that I personally know uh, is the case. So with those things working together, we do have the figures that I, that I gave to you. And we hope that that continues um, through the through the rest of the year. There are a number of large projects that are going on. I can tell you that um, uh, I'm not looking for sympathy here, but I did spend Labor Day weekend actually in New York City talking to some people about the Hartford property. I thought that was a very interesting conversation, and we have some new things to share with them as they decide to proceed forward as well. Today, I got a uh, an email from the Hartford indicating that they're very interested in participating in the Quick Tracks program, that the town will be part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, they they want to talk about it a little bit tomorrow, and we're happy to do that. But that's another sort of moving forward, moving the, um, the ball forward in that particular area as well. One of the other things that we're continuing to work on now is the, Will the, the Wetog uh, Village District uh, area. Uh, that's a project that we started last year. It wasn't completely funded, and so it's not completely done, but we'll, we're looking now to try to find a little bit more money to finish that up talking with a number of consultants right now. But that project alone has a tremendous amount of potential to actually create uh, some substance in that village. The Village Green we talked about. We talked about some additional development in that area. Some of that had to do with the Mitchell uh, uh, auto property as well. Um, so there's a lot of potential there as well. Uh, we do have a number of other large applications which are pending right now, some of which I, I can't talk about, others which are public information. Northeast Utilities property is in for a PAD right now. That's a large project. The southern portion of that project is a residential portion. The middle portion of that 60-acre parcel is where Northeast Utilities currently is located and will stay there. And then the northern portion of that particular property is scheduled to be a commercial, retail commercial project, small businesses. No large format retailers. Shouldn't be anything that people get too excited about. And it will take place and be built over a period of time, not all at once. So there's not going to be any tremendous uh, crush of traffic on, on Route 10. We all know that Route 10 is supposed to stay a two-lane highway. We're striving to, to make sure that that happens. And so um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Harm. Thanks for the presentation. And just to review the numbers, so this year, um, Joe reported that we have 150000 basically in additional revenue that we didn't anticipate. And um, the year prior to that, we actually had a about $12,000 increase. And the year prior to that, we had about a $242,000 increase. So the question is, do you have, um, you know, what impact do you see next year? Do you see that this trend is continuing because of all the efforts in the PAD and all the incentive uh, conversations that we've had with developers to anticipate that continuing? I think that it, there's a possibility that it could continue. I want to be very careful how I say this. I think that um, depends on a lot of it, depends on what happens to the Hartford property that would have a, a, the potential to, frankly, dwarf the $149,000 number um, if, it, if it goes forward. If it's done carefully and done in, in uh, accordance with the plans that we've developed and the way it's developed uh, according to those plans, um, that could be a significant number, no question about that. And, and I was also um, going to see if maybe Joe could follow up because we, uh, what we're tracking is permit fees, which are significant short-term um, benefits, but obviously these translate to additional tax dollars. So um, if we could have the impact of what the additional tax revenue will be ongoing, I think that will also be significant. Uh, because I think a lot of the projects that we've already brought in have already offset any potential loss to the Hartford in the short term as well. So yeah. it would be good to see those numbers. Maybe, Joe, you can present those to us. Yep. So again, the $150,000 additional money is just in the additional fees, which is great for the short term, but we're not 
that doesn't even the come the close iceberg. to yeah. the amount of money that the town will bring in in terms of additional commercial tax revenue. That's correct. And I, and I, but I want to be careful, too, that, that people that are either here this evening or, or maybe watching understand, too, that we want to be really careful about the, the total uh, the total amount of projects that we, we invite into town. Right. Um, there are no large format retailer. There are no nuclear waste facilities. You know, we're trying to be very careful with that kind of thing. Uh, it may not be that every single project that comes through the door people are in love with, but we're trying to do our best to filter those out to get the best out of every single project that comes through to make sure that it complies with the regulations and to the best of our ability that it complies with the, the plan of conservation and development that we set up uh, back in 2007. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Any other questions? Lisa. Um, then we'll move on. <coughs> two together. One, how many of the new projects are PAD projects? Two. Two. And I know the PAD talks about it's supposed to be used for attractive, innovative developments, environmentally wholesome, pedestrian-friendly, open space, and public amenities. Can you talk about those aspects of those projects that will be coming? Yeah, one of the one of the ones that's in right now hasn't been decided by the, the zoning commission, so I really don't want to talk about that publicly right now. I don't sure. want anybody to see, you know. Well, anything that's been approved, yeah. you could talk about the public amenities. The, the PAD, for example, yeah. with Powder Forest was the that has an assisted living facility that was a component of that. The portion of it right off of Hop Meadow Street on Powder Forest Drive. There's a small commercial component, possibility of a restaurant right there, uh, possibility of some small office buildings right there as well. Another portion of that, in addition to the assisted living facility, which was about 200,000 square feet, it's a big building, ultimately, not a footprint, but multi-story building. And then the other portion of that is um, essentially the, the lower portion of Carson Way. Maybe you can call that Landworks Development, who's doing Carson Way right now, also had a residential portion that comes down behind the, um, the Simsbury Inn as well. Some of those units are uh, small units. Uh, they're specifically set aside for people like millennials, for young folks that might want to walk to the bus stop. So there's actually going to be a pathway down to the to the bus stop. But that's as close as we can come to transit right now. Um, so for our the way we are, that's that's um, certainly is part. Is there an open space component in that plan? There is. There's there's a significant portion of that is open space as well, and that's really going to remain along Hop Meadow. There's a kind of a big lawn there that's going to remain there, uh, and some and some wetlands as well. So. So that's, that's certainly one of them. Um, one of the other um, PADs, as I said, is pending before the Zoning Commission right now, so we can get into that. But each of the PADs is unique. And whether it happens to be um, the most unique thing that people have ever seen or not is, is again, uh, a matter of some discussion. Uh, we have public hearings on those when the zone changes and the Public Planning Commission gets to, to come in and, re and refer those as well. So we're hopeful that, um, that any PAD that comes through will go through that thorough uh, discussion process and thorough deliberations prior to its approval. Are there criteria used to sort of I get at what those? I mean, it's easy to say in the beginning it's attractive, yeah, wholesome. Well, but what does that mean? Well, it's easy to say, but what happens yeah, is you exactly. have to look at it and decide in in context. You know, what does that mean? Exactly. And so, whether it means is something that has to do with uh, an addition to the uh, greenway, or whether it has something to do with providing for transit whether it has something to do with providing uh, residences for young folks that can't afford a two or 3,000 square foot colonial, that maybe they start out in a little 750 or 1,000 foot apartment. So those are all things that could, <coughs> excuse me, contribute to the, the overall amenities for the, for the development, as well as open space. And that's tied to the POCD? It has to be referenced to the POCD? It doesn't have to be, but the Planning Commission has to feel as though, it, number one, it's not in conflict with it. If there's a direct reference to it, that's great. That's all the more. But if they, in their judgment, ultimately feel that it's a good thing for the town, then ultimately that's what they can make a recommendation on. So, but they don't have to reference the POCD? And well, that's their job, just to yeah. talk about whether it does or doesn't. I would say, though, that they're not bound by that. In other words, it's a recommendation. And he, as you know, even if the Planning Commission recommends against a particular proposal, all that requires is that the Zoning Commission has to then uh, apply for votes to approve it anyway, which they would have anyway. But because we have six members on the commission, that's just the way the so law the POCD happened. is just a guide. It is. It's not a binding document. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, always has been. It was tons of discussion back on that about in 2007, and believe it or not, it's almost time to start thinking about yeah. doing that. Just so thinking about that. It's not going to be as painful <laughs> as that last time. I will guarantee <laughs> right. that. No. Nope. Guarantee. Nope. Um, I think I Cheryl had a question. And then um, actually, I, Lisa, I think covered. I was I was going to ask you for the benefit of the people who might not attend land use hearings all the time or watch them on TV to just to give a little quick you know, definition of what a PAD is, why we are, you know, seeing more of those now, 
and you know what you think the benefits are sure. to the town to have this type of development sure. coming in. First of all, I can't imagine why people wouldn't all flock to the, the zoning and planning meetings that they're just <laughs> so <know>. stimulating. <laughs> However, um, PAD was a regulation that we passed a, a few years ago in order to stimulate economic development. And it's been remarkably successful in that regard. I think that um, there are other towns around that are trying to figure out now, how do we do this? How do we make something happen? And we, we've come across a way to do it. Uh, we've used it in combination with the other types of things that we've done, uh, with combination with the form-based code. People get the idea that we have an, uh, an idea of what, where we're going, what we want to see. Mm -hmm. They also know that design is important. So the design review board plays an important part of that as well. So each of the PAD, and that's planned area development, mm -hmm. means that um, each of the commissions, the design review board, the planning commission, course conservation, wetlands, and the zoning commission as well, all talk about the application. <coughs> we recently had um, occasion to have the design review board and the zoning commission meet together to talk about it, and that hadn't happened much before. We're gonna have another one of those um, talking about the property at 690 Hop Meadow Street, the former Webster Bank building, probably coming up in a couple of weeks as well. That'll be another really interesting project that I think will have a lot, uh, not only uh, benefits from the permit uh, fees, but some significant advantages to the town in terms of its ultimate tax benefits as well. We obviously all wanna see that building stay, so one of the things that the PAD does is it allows us to preserve those kinds of structures as well as add new things around them which will help walkable, sustainable downtowns right. as well. So that's the idea of the PAD. Um, ideally, we would like to see more of them come downtown. Um, we also have some other needs for affordable <coughs> housing, so we need to figure out how we can do that as well. So we're trying to mm -hmm. sort of get people, whether twist their arm a little bit or whatever, to, to do some of those things downtown, and we're working on that now. Thank you. Sean, you had a question? Um, I do. Um, obviously, the, the Hartford property is taking time, and we all kind of understand that. That's that's the way it goes. There seems to be a rush for other property owners to kind of get projects going and through. Do you, do you view that as an impediment, or do you view it as kind of a supplement to what we're ultimately going to try to do down on the Hartford property? I you know, because Avon, you know, got theirs going pretty quick and obviously with the CLMP property it's just yeah it seems like there's a lot going on in that street all of a sudden I think I think there is I think you're absolutely right John I, I think that it gives us an, um, options though okay I think that as people come through the door we can begin to become a little bit more selective as opposed to just simply taking everything that's come through the door I think you could, all could probably look around town and decide that there's some particular project that got approved or you know got built you know years ago that probably it may have been a little bit different or maybe it should not have been approved or whatever but we hope that that getting these more options through the door will give us the ability to become more selective okay. so we think that the Hartford property obviously has a tremendous number of advantages there are some people that are very anxious to move forward some with some things down there but obviously it's a private piece of property so the Hartford obviously gets to to say what they want about it absolutely sure thank you yeah. Nancy had a question? I, um, <laughs> no, I, I, well, and just a quick little update, and it's kind of a, t a teaser a little bit, but um, uh, Lisa was talking about measurables, I guess, if, um, and, and how the plan of conservation and development and even the Zoning Commission uses the zoning regs, and um, we're hoping to bring the task force an update uh, back, working on some things that will, um, I think, help give the Economic Development Commission some measurables, and it's around the idea of um, you know, bolstering uh, uh, support for uh, bike path and, um, you know, measurables against where are we at in deficit for units of, of housing and different things like that. So um, to really look at a project and say, okay, it, it does all these things to support who we are as a community and, um, you know, open space and things like that that you mentioned. So um, we're excited to get started on that. I think one of the things that's really, really important is that we continue to hear it all the time, not only from developers, but from other people as well, is that we really need to make sure that the process stays clean and streamlined. And the answer may be no, that's fine. But we need a clean process that allows people to come in and get an answer. And if it's from me and I take my advice and say, take your silly plan and go home, that's fine. But come back with a good plan. Come back with a better plan. Refine it. Do something that we can really all appreciate. And, and, and I think I mean, that's where your, your um, review of the, of the process of the last few years has made a difference. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these applications come through, because developers feel they can get a decision, you know, having staff review where everybody's sitting at the table 
at one time, so you're saving time, you're saving money. You may be getting advice that says, um, we're, we don't like the plan, but you can certainly bring it forward. And I think, I think that uh, the staff has earned the respect of the developers so that there is a lot of time saved because if staff is not recommending it go forward, the developers are listening to that and taking it back and giving us a better plan. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's a credit to you and the, and the staff that we have so many increases in fees and applications is because the process is working and it is streamlined, it is predictable, it is quick, and that saves developers time and money, and that makes us a very attractive town to come to. Absolutely. That wasn't always the way. We used to have a very bad reputation yep. of being, um, you know, negative, not business friendly, and you know, you don't hear any of those uh, remarks anymore because you know the process is predictable. You may it may still result in a no vote from the commission, but they're elected to do that. Yep. But the question is, can you get the application through to a decision quicker and faster and uh, more predictable? And Absolutely. And I'd just like to say, too, that you know, <coughs> Jeff and, and the rest of the staff has been very helpful, too. If a project of, of some significant size comes in, we try to get everybody to sit down around the table uh, early on in the process before they draw a whole bunch of expensive plans right. and then um, and talk about it at that point, too. So, so that's been very helpful. Great. Thank you. Lisa. Um, <coughs> First of all, I want to thank um, Mary and Passports of Selectman because a lot of this um, came from the shred. One of the things from the shred was how do we expedite approval processes? Mm -hmm. And that was supported by this Board of Selectmen and Passports of Selectmen right. in terms of funding, which enabled you to do something like the PAD. The PAD is relatively new mm -hmm. regulation in the scope of our history. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen things that you, like I know there's obviously the 10 acre Part, you know, zone minimum acreage contiguous, it's limited to 10 acres or more, and then the next paragraph it says, except that it never applies because it's all grandfathered in. Did you find any other glitches in our no. regulation? That's the only one. Yeah, and those lot sizes were taken exactly from our current regulations. There was a specific conscious effort not to change the way the regulations currently functioned. So if it said it's 10 acres before, there was no, there was no attempt to change that. And so when the PAD was written, and I worked closely with the town attorney to do that, um, what we decided to do was to make sure that if anybody had a lot, and, and you know that that does apply to some lots, um, and that they would still be eligible for it. That, that's just the way it, it currently works. But I worked closely again with the town attorney to make sure that that was the way it was. Okay, it just seems kind of strange to put in a requirement that never applies. It's, called, it's basically called non-conforming lot. You know, no, if you've, I know, if you've I know got what that is. Yeah, half acre but, lot, ha but it's strange in terms of writing legislatively to put something in that will never apply. So it's, why do that? Well, it really, it, it goes hand in hand with uh, basically the state's theory with regard to non-conforming lots. That's basically what it is. If you did it and you eliminated them, then you'd be subject to a, a complaint potentially about that. Yeah. So <laughs> any questions? Everybody's got a chance to ask some questions. Just one other thing to throw out for the public to be aware of. Uh, both the Planning and Zoning Commissions have now allowed informal discussions, so exactly. they, just, they can come in, and that that was a huge step. Uh, a lot of nervousness on a lot of people's yeah. side, but it has worked very, very well. And you were on the commission when you did that, Mike, so you found that helpful, a helpful oh, tool, as opposed to a more formal process. Yes. Good to know. That's great. Okay. Thanks, Harm. Good Thanks thing, for Harm. sharing. Thank you. Thanks, um, next item is uh, update. I just had a couple quick updates. First, wanted to report that um, Simsbury was named the tenth safest town in Connecticut. A study by Safe Choice Security found Simsbury to be the tenth safest city in the state. They consulted the 2012 FBI crime statistics, and uh, they compared the FBI st statistics on property and violent crime rates in cities around Connecticut. And based on that comparison, we were rated number 10. So let's uh, work hard to keep that um, low crime rate um, down. I wanted to just publicly thank the chief. Um, Peter Ingbertson, as well as uh, the men and women in the department for uh, all of their commitment to community policing. I just wanted to uh, also thank the chief um, and the officers for a terrific um, picnic. And uh, I know a couple of board members were able to go, so I'm glad that, uh, that folks were able to come and uh, glad people enjoyed themselves. I um, want to remind folks to go to the Simsbury Women's Club 45th Annual Arts and Crafts Festival this weekend. Um, it will be held on Saturday the 13th and Sunday the 14th, rain or shine, so let's hope for rain. It's on Iron Horse Boulevard. Uh, more than 100 juried artists and craft people will be there. They'll have food, drink, baked goods, and the money that um, is, is raised um, from the uh, craft show, it is free to go, but if the money that's uh, 
collected by the vendors goes to support a number of uh, charitable organizations and the Simsbury Women's Club does a great job in sponsoring a number of great organizations. So come and spend your money. Uh, this week, uh, September 14th through the 20th was declared a 2014 Constitution Week. Uh, we joined the President and the Congress of the United States in declaring September 14th and 20th as Constitution Week. And uh, it marks, September 17th marks the 227th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. And Constitution Week provides us with an opportunity to learn about and reflect on uh, the rights and privileges of our citizens and um, what the Bill of Rights guarantees and what our responsibilities are as public servants. So I just wanted to announce that. Uh, finally, just some new faces in Simsbury's uh, workforce. We've been busy filling a number of positions as a result of um, some employees who have moved on and some employees who have retired. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a number of uh, new faces and great candidates. We had a, a number of uh, wonderful applications. I think uh, for every significant, every job, we've had um, a number of applications that made it very hard uh, to select folks. Um, but we have in the library, uh, Carol Freeman is joining us as part-time library administrative assistant. Joanne Moody as a children's room library services assistant. Sarah Ray, a teen services librarian, our first ever for the town of Simsbury, and that was approved during the budget process. And Andrea Torillo as a part-time circulation assistant. In buildings and grounds, uh, Richard Valer Valerio, he is a veteran of the U.S. Army. He's joined us in the second shift as a building custodian. And our Simsbury Farms golf course, Brian Johnson has joined us as assistant golf course superintendent. In our planning department, Rachel Blatt is assistant town planner, much to the delight of Hiram, who's been anxious to fill that position. Uh, she comes to us from the town of Enfield, and you'll get a chance to meet her shortly. In the police department, we hired uh, Trevor Britt Brittell. He's patrolman first, and um, all of the positions have been funded and have been filled in the police department. There were no um, budget uh, reductions in the department. And in central administration, the board selectmen approved Eric Gomes to work with the Board of Ed as the benefits coordinator. So we wanted to uh, publicly welcome all of those folks to the town of Simsbury. Um, our first action tonight is the approval of the tax refunds. We have a number of tax refunds totaling $8,896.02. Um, the complete list that has been reviewed and approved by the tax collector and is recommended to the Board of Selectmen is in front of you and is public information. Is there any, are there any questions on the list? Move to approve. Second. Second. We have a second. Mike second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next item is an emergency generator project update. Um, if the board selecting recalls, the Board of Finance, come on up, Jeff. Um, the Board of Finance did uh, authorize a, a pool of money for the emergency generator use. Um, based on that authorization from the Board of Finance and the Board of Selectmen, we did go out to RFP process uh, for all of the projects. Uh, the projects did come in over the amount budgeted and given to us by the Board of Finance. So um, we have an update for uh, the Board of Selectmen. Basically, uh, we have three items. One, um, if we all go back to that awful uh, winter weather, uh, we remember uh, 10 days of uh, uh, folks being without power in Simsbury and the thousands that were served during our shelter. And um, as a result of that experience, uh, that awful experience, there were a couple of uh, public emergency, um, I guess you would say public emergency lessons that we learned. And the first was that um, we really didn't have enough uh, generator power in the town hall to keep um, the emergency operations center going um, as much as, as a backup as we had liked. Uh, second lesson we learned was that um, we didn't have a way for folks who lived across the river in Terrafield to be able to get to um, our shelter on the other side of the river at the high school. So we had to look, look at uh, what we could do in Terrafield. And third, um, we realized that the capacity at the high school um, didn't meet our needs when we had that many people for that period of time. So based on those um, three guiding principles, um, Jeff went out to bid, um, worked with Tom Roy and our staff um, and Rich Sawitzki to really take a look at what capacity we would need. So that's the purpose of uh, tonight's report. And uh, Jeff's going to give the board um, an update on what the bids showed and what next recommended action. So thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> thanks, Mary. <clears throat> so as Mary said, uh, we had indicated back in July we thought we'd be over budget based on our consultants' estimates uh, prior to bidding. Um, we did get all the bids in um, with the funding available, which was about $301,000. Uh, we came up around $330,000 short. So the budget was, was 
very aggressive or, or the, the scope was very aggressive at the end of the day after all our investigations trying to hone the scopes of the projects we still found that we came up very short on the project so in talking to public safety committee the department uh, public works director uh, we came up with a recommendation for moving forward uh, primarily uh, the, the the prime uh, facilities that we would need during an emergency, that being the emergency shelter at the high school, the secondary shelter, I guess I'd call it, at Terrafil Elementary School, and also to provide some infrastructure in Town Hall to be able to accommodate a portable generator if, in fact, our main generator went down since this is our emergency operations center. So go, moving forward with those three items, we come up approximately $70,000 short uh, that's also accommodating the grant, the $59,000 grant we got from FEMA that's dedicated to the Terrafield School, so we can't use that anywhere else. And uh, we do have some time to spend that, uh, just for a little perspective. I think we have until two, 2016 on that grant. So in, you know, in moving those forward, we're continuing to look at the infrastructure needs at Eno, at the library, and at the portable in terms of what we need, what we can compromise on. Uh, to get us, I guess, what we need. Originally, we were hoping to power Eno 100% and power the light library 100%. And looking at the uh, emergency operations center here because of the need for power here. Um, but looking at it for a second time, I guess, and continuing to look at that, that we think we might be able to reduce those costs, requiring less money than actually the, the total of 330 thousand dollars we really just haven't had the time to do that we're in the process of looking at that now uh, we're suggesting during budget time next year we'd be in a position to better address that if in fact that those funds don't become available before that time so with that again we're, we're looking for a recommendation or, or, or suggesting a recommendation to move forward with Terrafel, the high school and some minor work here at the uh, town hall thanks Jeff questions Lisa um, first of all, I have to give another congratulations to you for your work on this. This came to you fast and furious as you first got here, picking up on um, work that had begun but that needed to be completed. I want to thank you for your extraordinary efforts. People don't realize how hard you've worked on this. Um, you've given tremendous updates to the public safety, and I want to thank you for that. If you could talk a little bit about um, the high school. Can when you speak up. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa. Okay. <laughs> At the high school, um, one of the big issues we ran into is that the freezers and refrigerators were not hooked up to the generator, and that was one of the major drivers for upgrading the generator. Can you talk about what other things you identified at the high school that needed um, attention? Sure. Um, we did a fairly exhaustive uh, investigation of the high school. Um, went through a process of actually shutting down power and going through a process of determining what has not, what is not powered by emergency gen generator and what is. Um, we also did a load analysis of those loads and also a, a load analysis of the entire high school. What we found is that the existing generator there provides something less than 40% uh, of the total load capacity for the high school. Um, to actually power the entire high school would uh, require a tremendous uh, supplemental generator, frankly, of 500 kilowatts. We knew the budget wouldn't support that. And we so, weren't looking for that. And we weren't looking for that. And we kept focusing on uh, the emergency, emergency needs, operations right. center, which includes some you know, important facilities like the cafeteria, uh, the gymnasium, the main office, uh, some bathroom facilities. So. To accommodate those, um, we determined that we need a, about a 250 kilowatt generator to supplement the existing 250 kilowatt. So just kilowatt. to be clear, this was not mission creep. You just kept it to the core of services that would be needed to to operate during an emergency. We this did. was not, we didn't, they're not add-ons here. These are the core services. That's correct. So overall, these two generators will power about 70% of the load for the high school. Um, and down the road, if there's energy efficiency projects that occur and there's under, under discussion at the high school right now, 
we can do additional load on the high school, exactly. but frankly, we're focusing on the, the needs for the emergency operations And center. then timetable for deliverables on these, you could begin? Uh, timetable really depends on which, what the contractor proposes to use for equipment. The different manufacturers have different lead times. They but you may. can start the bid process. Oh, we already bid it. We have. We've yeah. actually bid all these items. Yeah. We have. Uh, I mean, that's why we have the analysis. Right, but, but right, right. So we can, if the board approves and the board of finance approves, we can execute the contract. That's what I'm asking. That's correct. So that's almost immediate in terms of execution once we get the approvals. It would be, you know, fairly soon. Within the next couple of weeks, we'd have a signed contract. Then they could, you know, do their ordering of generators. Exactly. Find out exactly the what the lead begins, time is. Right. Um, but certainly there's a few month lead time as a rule on these. It could change. It could be less. could be more. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Sean? Just a, oh. a tag on to that. So... I think this was when I was on public safety when we were talking about this. The original scope included looking at the, the wiring at the high school, right? Because the problem was things were turning on that we didn't need during the, the, the storms. And other things weren't turning on that we needed, like the, the freezers, right? And That's during correct. the storm, you guys had to pull some magic off and rewire everything. That's so correct. how did it then turn into all of a sudden we need to double the capacity down there? Well, we did look at actually all the buildings in terms of recircuiting to accommodate the existing generation capacity right. and the actual cost of that is very significant okay it's more um, than this is it? the wiring okay. at the high school is old okay the, there's a, you know that no, it true. makes it that was the missing piece for me I was yeah, yeah that was, that was the think that the the renovated um, that was the addition would have upgraded all of the wiring but it wasn't it wasn't gotcha. built in to the system so you have the old wiring gotcha. on some portions of the of the building and then trying to bring in it, it wasn't as simple as just adding on and that makes perfect yeah. sense actually what we did at, for the terrafil uh, bid package we actually looked at it both ways we looked at it with a full generator for the entire building yep. or a smaller generator with the recircuiting and the bids actually came in with a couple of th within a couple of thousand dollars of, of each other hmm. because of the cost of labor yeah working in tight spaces yeah. um it just lost holes in the wall and all that fun stuff it's yeah. cheaper to actually gen you know provide generation for the whole building right. so similarly for the high school if we went that way it would probably turn out the same no, that makes sense. And then all along we've been talking about the need because I think what we found out during the storm was that you're not really supposed to keep this thing on for a week outside here, and that's really not a good idea, right? And well, and if, so it, if, it, mm -hmm. if something should happen. If it goes down, yeah, we're in, we're in big trouble with this building, obviously, with the EOC here and, and 911 and all the other things that we've got. So that makes a lot of sense that that's obviously still part of this, and I think that's always been part of the scope, right? That's sure right. We, we still that. will not have the portable generator capacity in right. the house, but we'll have the ability to rent uh, or provide a smaller generator if, in a pinch in this location if we need it until we actually get a portable that's of the proper size for this building. Uh, Nancy had a question. And Lisa, I think I'm good, actually. So I, can, yeah. I just wanted to um, make the point in terms of managing expectations. The terrafil generator will and emergency shelter will be secondary. We still expect people, and in most storms, you'll hear about um, sheltering in place for 24 hours to 36 hours, depending on the exam or the extent we're expecting. And then, well, if a need for an emergency shelter is, comes about, the first one to be open will be the high school. And ter so people shouldn't expect that whenever we open the high school shelter, we are also opening okay. the mm -hmm. terrifying shelter. No, that's mm -hmm. a good point. I think mm -hmm. we, you and the Public Safety Committee need to have a conversation about how we're going to staff. You know, we, exactly. we don't have a lot of staff. So uh, as we saw, our staff was stretched pretty thin, just keeping the, the high school shelter uh, mm -hmm. operating. So we would maybe need some additional volunteers and terrafil. I mean, so if I'm uh, sure you can have that, add that to your agenda. Actually, I just spoke with uh, Kevin Kowalski about that today, and so that will be on uh, forthcoming yeah. agendas in public safety. You're Important exactly issue. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I, I assume we're going to get to the recommendation piece. So there's two pieces there, right? You're looking for 308, but then you're actually looking for less? For 330? No, because that would include everything, but we're not we're not recommending it. We're not doing the whole thing. Okay. We're just recommending because it's too big a number. And okay. in conversations with our finance director, when we we've been meeting about once the bids came in, what the best um, recommendation for the board of selectmen would be, and to do everything is cost prohibitive, and it, it made the finance director very nervous. So um, <laughs> we, you know, we decided. Nervous. Uh, what was important to, for public safety right now, what was Thank the best you, thing we could do for our residents was to make sure, one, that the EOC is open yep. and has a backup system, two, and make sure that if we need, God forbid, the 
shelter again mm -hmm. at the high school, we could accommodate the numbers that we accommodated. And third, that folks who couldn't cross the river would have a place, right. an option. Yeah. Um, while we'd like to do, and we think it's important to do the other items down the line, we have time during the next budget cycle okay. to talk about how we're going to fund those. Okay. And we felt if we didn't have those, at least we would have the, the top priorities uh, addressed in the short term. Okay. And we wanted to get those done as soon as possible um, before the next winter storm, which could be in October. As we okay. Know. So when I look at the recommendation chart, I see the 156, which includes the 59 from the grant. I exactly. see the 152. I add those together, but there's already funds towards those that we have, or there's already funds appropriated that we can then allocate towards those? Yes. Because that's why, that's why 70 plus 70 doesn't equal those yes. numbers. Correct. Okay. There's also a housekeeping item in terms of the FEMA grant. We never appropriated those funds, so we also want to do that. So you'd like um, a motion to tr Two request motion. the transfer of 70000 Correct. And to authorize the appropriation of the FEMA grant funds of $59,213 right. to the Terrafo project. And then to send those recommendations to the Board of Finance. Yes. Okay. Um, and just uh, working the math backwards here then, this this 330,000 less the 70. Your point is you may not need 260 when you come back. You're saying you're going to go back because you don't know that you'll need 100% capacity at these other places. You might be able to look exactly. at how that mm -hmm. can be even reduced further. That's right. Okay. Great. Any other questions? We have a motion. Actually, can I do one more? I'm sorry. I'm I'm not okay. trying to be a pain. Nope. It's just a lot of numbers and yep. a lot of math nope. on here. There's a lot of information. So, so the, on the recommendations, it's 156 <laughs> plus 152 plus the 59, too. So it's roughly 367,000 is the total appropriation that you're, or the total expenditure that you're looking for? Yeah, there's also a slight continue, a small contingency okay. in there for construction, a 5% of construction costs that we're, we're carrying. Okay. In the so budget. And the, the, part, the part where I get confused is we already appropriated, what, 242 to this? Correct. And then there's 59 from FEMA. Correct. Correct. So how do we get 170? 70. Or excuse me, 140. 70. 70,000. 70. Aren't you asking for 70 Again, twice? appropriation, I'm once. assuming once. the appropriation no, is once. done. Okay. The motion would be 70,000, transfer 70,000, and then appropriate the grant. So, all right, maybe I'm getting this confused. I would recommend the Board of Selectmen recommend authorize a budget transfer of 70 grand Correct. and refer to the Board of Finance for additional project. I would also suggest the Board of Finance recommend an appropriation of 70 in additional funds along with the appropriation of 59 in grant funds. Isn't that 70 twice? Um, no, uh, no, it's the 59 for FEMA and it's the 70. Yeah, I think you're reading it. The, the late, yes, I think you're reading it. You're correct. It sounds like it, it, there's confusion over it twice, but it's the only once. It's only once? Yes. All right, I'll show mm -hmm. up now. Yeah. Thank you. As long as it's only once. No, only once. No, only once. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I'm doing the adding yeah. and the subtracting. No. We're Thanks running up the 70 grand extra no. at the end. Mm -hmm. The emotion on the f page one is yeah. emotion yes, the uh, before the board. Okay. That's the uh, transfer of 70 plus the appropriation of the grant. Well, considering I've been such a pain, I, I uh, <laughs> make that motion. I'm sorry, you know me with the numbers. Do we need two separate no motions or do we need one motion? Uh, we can do one motion. Okay. So you I, don't yeah. need two separate one for FEMA? I do not. Okay. So you want to make that motion so the clerk To authorize the budget transfer of 70000 and that we uh, appropriate the 59213 in grant funds for the Terrafil School Generator Project yeah. and refer those to the Board of Finance. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. It's a lot of information, a lot of hard work, but um, it's really uh, great to move those projects forward. So thanks, thanks, Tom, for your input on that as well. Um, next item is to approve the fee schedule for the Simsbury Farms ice skating rink and paddle tennis courts as recommended by the Simsbury Farms Complex Committee and Coastal Parks and Recreation Commission. And just for uh, housekeeping purposes, um, Joe, do you know when the next meeting or jury of the um, Subcommittee that the Board of Selectmen appropriated to look at the Sensory Farm Special Revenue Fund will meet again. Do you have a date? Okay, and, th and this hasn't been reviewed by them, this recommendation. Okay. No. So, uh, Jerry, go ahead. <clears throat> if you want to explain the fees recommended tonight, you want Uh, you have in front of you a submission for the uh, uh, both the uh, ice rink and paddle tennis court fees for the upcoming winter season. Um, actually, the current season, which is starting right now. 
this was actually this was acted upon uh, at a joint meeting of the Park and Rec Commission and the Cemetery Farms Complex Committee. Um, you may recall during the uh, last budget process, there was a um, lengthy discussion and process of how to close the gap in the revenue fund, and there were uh, uh, under the projected revenue increases. Uh, there was a, a, a line item actually uh, for $5,000 through the increase of the 14-15 uh, rink rates as well as $1,800 for the 14-15 uh, uh, paddle tennis court rates. So the commission took that in hand and, and the complex committee when they, um, when they worked on this um, and uh, asked us for recommendations, try to look at all our, our different rates. Um, that we have our rental rates so that's, that's our on the, the rink that's our uh, uh, biggest source of revenue um, and uh, as well as the paddle uh, court rates in terms of where they can uh, uh, where they felt they should be increased and given our again our expenses with the uh, uh, both utility and manpower costs to keep those uh, those courts operational so that's uh, you have in front of you those uh, those recommendations Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. A question on the, um, I know you said in the memo that there's, uh, the, the new fees will just expect to generate about $8,000. Right. And I know during the budget process, we talk about um, revenues offset by users. And so I was wondering if you track the same thing um, in terms of the number of, whether, whether the increases will reduce the number of users. Similar to the golf course conversation we have during yeah. the budget process. Oh, and I absolutely. didn't see any of the, user information here so just we haven't um in in either of these cases you know we have not seen that and and that was discussed by the by the commission um i think uh you know particularly when you look at uh you know the ice rink and and what groups are, are uh, paying at other facilities i think they're uh certainly our increases are uh, are in line given uh utility and manpower costs but we have not seen any evidence of, of people not using if that, if that I understand your yeah, question. Yeah, do you track yeah. the number of users that you can yeah, provide actually, us? Yeah, so actually, all we do in, in every area. Okay. Yeah, so and and you and can get that. That would be helpful. Yeah, too. we uh, we actually do that as uh, uh, at the conclusion of every season. We're putting the pool uh, and camp report together now on on that very thing. But um, yeah, and the rink we've never last year actually was the highest uh, uh, revenue uh, from that facility probably in the last ten years. Um, and we saw, you know, large increase, a relatively significant increase in both instructional program and public skate, which uh, I think was very encouraging. Um, so we've not seen any uh, uh, any reduc reduction in use to, to answer your question. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Cheryl. Um, Percentage-wise, how do these increases compare with the increases for golf and swimming? Um, well, swimming, there wasn't any increase this year. So um, that's how okay. that compares. I guess I was. <laughs> uh, golf. Um, okay. I, I, you know, golf. I I, I'd have a, to go I back and look. I we have so many different feed groups and free structures, um, and it's hard really to compare apples and apples. And, and even our, our costs are different at both. So I'd have to go back and, and really look and see how they compare. But I was just thinking, as a percentage of the flat fee, you know, does one go up five percent and one go up ten percent, or and do you? Track well, as I say, the pool fees didn't go up at all. Um, so that answers mm -hmm. that. But as far as the golf, I would say uh, probably pretty comparable. Over, if you were to take our overall fee structure and what the increase was last year, mm -hmm. uh, and what the overall increase is on the fee structure, I would say they're probably very comparable. Yeah. And again, just the cost of operating the facility factors into what the fees are. It does, and they're both so very different. I that's know that the, skating. That's mm -hmm. a very expensive operation to run right. I mean, high keeping, utility yeah high utility high cost, cost high manpower cost yeah, yeah. so that that right. factors into i was just thinking for the, res does. the residents who use it you know one person's paying a 10 percent increase and one person's paying a five percent increase you can it walk on the bike path for free it's true <laughs> um i have the other question i have is how are the fees collected for say paddle tennis does somebody staff that or how, how do you do that how does that well by a, a couple of ways um uh you know with some of the uh, the larger groups the rental groups that are, have we, we really encourage long term you know long term rental groups so oftentimes they'll pay all at once um and and it reduces our you know really it, it makes it easier for them easier for us uh we have less staff time up there now we have less uh 
time at our reception desk are hours, as, as you all know. There, there have been, you know, we've dramatically reduced them. Mm -hmm. So we try and make it easier for, you know, for people, uh, uh, you know, to come in and pay. Um, and, and, you know, when people come up and, and pay as they go, we're, you know, we're right, right across the street from, from the courts. So most people just come in and pay. And the courts are always open? Or? By and large, yeah. I mean, whether, you know, whether dependent, right. we have to, uh, uh, you know, make sure our guys have to make sure they're clear. We have the, you know, the propane and the heaters going. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, you know, by and large, I mean, all things mm -hmm. being equal, they're open, yeah. But I think at night, Jerry, the lights and the propane are not turned on unless they're reserved. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. So, yeah. okay. uh, you know, so that's what I was wondering is how yeah, that works. Kind of on, mm -hmm. you know, usable, but yeah. Yeah. That, there's a cost associated with that. And Absolutely. And I think what Jerry had recommended is that if people want to use it, then they just they have to reserve it so that the right. lights can be turned on with a timer. Those are on timers that's right. as well. Yeah. So well, that's what I was wondering is how we regulate the usage. We'd go on to that and, actually a couple of years ago. Yeah. I think also I think one of the, uh, you know, with the propane, you know, mm -hmm. with the cost of propane and the amount. And, and the other thing you should know, too, is, is when we did go up on our on the paddle fees, you know that was really in, in it was a in response to people that wanted to see the courts uh, in better shape and, and ready sooner and on a longer basis. So there was a higher cost to that. Mm -hmm. um, so we were really just passing along the cost of keeping the you know the courts you know playable in maybe more inclement weather than we might have you know in other circumstances. So and then I think it became all the more important um, you know to get those timers because you know the the last thing you know you want is you know, you're heating courts that aren't being, you know, that right. aren't being used, and that was well. Our, that's what I was thinking. Is how do, how do you yeah. regulate that right. that usage? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jerry, forgive me if you already said this, but excuse me, Sean. When, when you came up with the the rates for the skating center, was there a similar analysis done as with the golf course in terms of what ISCC charges, what Westminster might charge? Well, the golf that's... course is easier, Sean. Yeah. You know, it's, it's more of an apples to apples, um, and we do we we with the golf course we look at probably ten other courses. Okay. Um, well, municipalities, some privately run public, but by and large, you know, and, and it's an easier comparison. Our rink is different. There aren't many, you know, outdoor covered rinks. Yep. Um, most of them are, you know, are, are indoor facilities, the ISCCs yep. and the other rinks. So we're, you know, we're kind of in a different niche and a different, you know, uh, market altogether. Okay. Um, so it's a little different. It's easier to do that comparison with other facilities than it is with the rink. Yep. And I think it was raised earlier, Jerry, so if you are using the courts, the paddock courts, uh, during the day, you reserve them, you pay. That's correct. And if you are using them during the day and your office is open, you pay. Yeah. And, but if someone, um, if the office is closed and someone walks on and uses it, they, they can it's live free. it up. So that, so that, that's, that's like using. So that, that is the policy. If right. if you're not there, people can just pay for free. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think we want to lock the courts. No. After no, hours, I, I right? Agree. I mean, you no, we of, don't. So what other options do you have for folks who? Um, you know, I, I mean, there's a fairness argument. You know, I pay during the day, and you're there. Right. I, you know, I get charged, and if you're not there, I don't. Well, have only to pay. I would say, so yeah, if, if we're you? there, if we're there, there's probably, you know, we're 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 making the courts playable for you. If someone came up there, um, you know, they're not going to be prepared. They're not. You're not going to have the, you know, the propane. You're not going to have the, the the staffing there that's going to clear them for you. So you're kind of going to get them in a, you know, probably not in the condition that somebody, not in the condition that someone who's paying is going to get them okay. for. So when they pay, there's that expectation on everyone's part that they're going to be prepared and, you know, for you to play on. So I guess that would be. And the, there's been no problem in having the courts ready to go um, when there are reserve times. So you don't no. find it's hard to get the. The court's ready to go for those who the reserve. toughest thing is first thing in, in, on a weekday morning after a storm or a weekend morning after a storm okay. because obviously you've got everybody and you're trying to get the rink open particularly if you've got you know hockey coming right. in at eight in the morning um you're trying to get all the walkways done We're, so that's the toughest thing and we try and and i think by and large people understand um but the the next thing after we get the you know the walkways the roadways done the rink open then the guys are on the uh, they're on the paddle courts okay. yeah other questions lisa um, in your, your report, you did say that, following up on Sean's question, that you did um, look to other rink facilities. So, so who did you look to? You know, we talked. We talked to veterans. They're a, they're a municipal facility, although, again, they're they're charging a very. They have a different, very different right. fee structure than us. They're probably the most comparable. There's really uh, Excuse me. Um, just the one, or did you talk to others? Um, 
in, you know, we, we go online, we look, we talk to others, that, you know, that are in our, you know, that are in our field. We may talk, you know, it's more along the lines of what are you looking at in terms of increases and, and what are they related to? Um, because we really, like I said, no one, you know, our fee structure is so different from, from any of those, That's even right. veterans or even ISCC or any. There's just, it's more, <clears throat> excuse me, along the lines of, you know, what are you seeing as your, your operating costs and no, how you're trying I, I to address that. them. I appreciate that. And also for paddle courts, did you compare with other paddle courts out we there? We did not, no. no. Okay. And then, um, first of all, I want to thank you and your commissions for looking at this. I know you've been charged for finding savings and I appreciate it but I don't want you to your you or your commission to feel that you need to nickel and dime your budget we have a broader problem and which is why the subcommittee was formed and I'm hoping that they'll look at these issues comprehensively so that you don't have to spend your time we need broad solutions to the issues here and 8,000 is certainly admirable but it's not going to solve the problems and so we don't want to put you in a position where you're you know being well, penny wise and pound foolish and I, I, we want to yeah. make sure that you're supported broadly because the solution is going to be broad and comprehensive right. and i just don't i'm concerned about piecemealing solutions along the way and making you feel like you're there's a pressure for you to piecemeal it without a comprehensive plan no that's a good point and i, I did talk to jerry today about whether um the subcommittee had taken a taken an opportunity to look at the overall comprehensive fee schedule for all of the programs and um I think it's up to the board whether they want to do it before approving or after, but I think certainly it needs to go to the, this question needs to go to the, the subcommittee because they're um, the ones look really getting to the yeah. details about how much, you know, we don't charge to rent library books, so how much are you going to charge to Function. use, right. you know, a court or swim? So I mean, we think there's a fairness of what basic services we want to offer and then what level of services we want to offer at a higher yeah. cost. So. That's, you know, it's up to the board when you, when you want to do that, if you want to do it before or after, but I think it has to be done. I agree with you, Lisa. This has, it has to be looked at at a conference. If, if I could just add, I'm, I'm on that subcommittee. We've, we've been taking it, quite honestly, from, from a much higher level approach because we don't, get, we don't want to redo the work of Culture Parks and Rec. Those, you folks are looking at those fees, doing the comparison. That, that wasn't the charge of the committee, but we are looking at the comprehensive right. financial picture down there in terms of allocations, in terms of, you know, in terms of overall revenue generated versus, you know, individual skate sharpening. I, I know, think we should, I'd like to refer anyway, I would like the subcommittee to look at the fees because I think that, you know, you, you can't have a conversation about the special revenue fund without having a conversation of what the level of fees are. Because Jerry can make that balance tomorrow by yep. charging, you know, $300 for nine, you know, nine holes of gold. So I, I mean I think it's, it's fair, and again I'm not yeah, I'm not no, averse I, to it. But. I agree, but I think I think it would I personally would like to see the subcommittee take a look at where the fees are going, how the increases. I think Cheryl's point was valid about That's the, where I was the going. increases mm -hmm. in one component yeah. versus another component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just so, did the I mean, schedule. I mean, if they don't want to yeah. look at it, then we can no, look at it. But I think we certainly needs can. To look but at you know, again, we've we've been a little higher up because uh, I'll be honest with you. Again, there's no decisions have been made, but. You know, we're going to have some tough discussions, I think, in our budget in terms of what do we do and, you know, and allocations and other things. It's going to be exactly. a multifaceted solution. It it's not just going to be, you know, yeah. Jerry to fix. It's no, going to you know, take all be, of us. And, can we squeeze any more money out or yeah. have we maxed out what we want to charge people for using the facility? And if the answer is yes, yep. you know, when you look comprehensively at what other towns, if we're, if we're higher, Mm -hmm. Then I think that sends a message to it does. us. It talked about your usage yeah. concern, which is mm -hmm. which is fair. Yeah, I mean, on this, I mean, I ran the, I ran the numbers. I mean, we got thirty percent increases, twelve percent, thirteen, yeah. twenty-five, five, four. You know, and again, I'm sure that I don't know. If the, I'm sure they're valid because you folks are all looking at that. But to your point, we haven't looked at that comprehensively. Right. So, so I guess you know, if the I'm board, off for another meeting. Yeah, no, and if <laughs> if the board um, feels comfortable approving. Uh, the recommendation of the Parks and Rec tonight, then I'll support that. I, and then I'd like to make a motion to refer it to the subcommittee to get a more comprehensive uh, review. But if the board wants to push it to the subcommittee, just that we, I was hoping that if there was a subcommittee meeting sooner, then maybe we could postpone the decision on the fees. But I think you, your point is these fees need to go in place sooner yeah, rather than Yeah, we're six weeks away from, right. I was just you know, So I don't have a problem the approving them tonight, yeah. but I would like them to then refer it to the subcommittee. Lisa. The, the other thing mm -hmm. issue, and it's it, minuscule, and I appreciate you reaching out to the high school. I mean, we are, to some extent, robbing Peter to pay Paul when we increase the rates to the high school. Now, that said, the town does bear the costs of maintaining the rink, and there needs to be some cost-sharing arrangement with the high school, but that needs to be part of the comprehensive picture. 
And I think that we can, you know, we need to start looking at this, how we share maintenance, how and we share services. And that's a good point. And the pay to play fees. of for right. hockey, I don't know what the costs are now. It's expensive. So it's more than so a regular. So are we adding you know. a burn? I just, I'm, there's a lot of issues out there. And I, I, my inclination is not to do it tonight, but not to hold you responsible for that money either. Because we know that you guys are trying so hard and we know, you know, not when you come back to us at the end of the season and you're down revenues that we say, well, why didn't you make 8000 up somewhere else? I mean, to hold you harmless for that, given that there are comprehensive issues out there that need to be addressed, my inclination is this piecemeal approach has me concerned when there's a comprehensive solution that needs to be found. And I, to your credit, I appreciate everything you've done. I think you've done a great job looking for savings in a very tough situation in your board. And my inclination would be to hold you harmless for this because it doesn't make sense for you to keep having to struggle when we're looking for a comprehensive solution for you. But I'm open to your thoughts on that. I just don't want you to feel like the pressure here. No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, the charge has been given. Um, and I, I don't know that, you know, you're, you feel these can are reverse fair. that right yeah and and the only other thing i would say too is it, it, just going back to you know we're, we're six weeks away you know from opening yeah. you've got a couple things one you've got uh um, one you know particularly large user group that you know their entire budget is is related to ice time and and you know they need to know yeah. um this is really beyond where they you know where they where they should be but and the other thing is you know we've been trying to work with getting new users in and and to say six weeks before, we can't tell you. We're not sure, you know, what yeah. you're going to be, you know, charging. It hurts us, you know, to, to try and get, you know, get some of these new people. I would in. be inclined to vote it down and then let and, <laughs> you know, the it's, cost it's and up the board to you. I, I know that's what you're saying. You're saying that mm. the special revenue fund would just be that much. Um, that's until we have a solution. Until we have a solution. Right. I, 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 just I John and then. Uh, well, my, and my concern really is, is that. You, and you guys, you know, you've done your due diligence in making a comparative and looking at some increases. And if these increases aren't implemented for this season, and a, a larger analysis is done, and there's a pretty large increase that's needed next time around, just to kind of level things off, um, that that's a bit harder for people to swallow. Absolutely. Is. Um, and I certainly think um, I absolutely agree in something being more comprehensive, and then looking at things to say, okay, you know, if my facility f uh, usage fee or, or you know maintenance fee. And, and running the facility is percentage increase of X, then that group is going to increase by that amount incrementally across the board right. more fair, but not necessarily something you can apply in a percentage from facility to facility to facility. Um, but that would just be my concern. I agree with you trying to get out there to folks and let them know what's going on now. They're right. planning their budgets and um, and just the, the fear of, of being that farther behind next right. year. So. I mean, just and I mean, it, to, to be fair, too, let's say we do, by some grace of God, meet six times in the next six weeks to, and get these figured out from a comprehensive plan. We're then going to go change them on, change the fees on these people last minute, and I don't think that's that's. I don't a good think idea. that's the way we want to go. No, yeah, I mean, we, we we need to kind of decide tonight either we're not going to do nothing for the entire season, or we're going to do these and right. review it with all the subcommittees and everything else. And the comprehensive plan really starts for the next golf season, right? The next pool season. And then the it's next, season. it's it's yeah. next year's paddle. It's next year's. But it's not that far away. You know, we put a budget together not, in December. Yeah. Well, and I agree. We we got to. So, but know, my concern yeah. is, is this? It'll be the most miraculous subcommittee if we can get it all done in four weeks. That's that's probably not a reality given the gravity of the issue and and the, the comprehensive approach we've we've got to look at. And again, you know, we can't come back to Simsbury Hockey in six weeks and say, sorry, it's not 165. It's actually going to be 206. You know, and if we're going to do that yeah. too, then we're going to do it to them next year not this year in, in six weeks. So Lisa, I totally hear what you're saying, uh, but whatever we do saying. tonight, we got to kind of live with for the next you know, 12 right. months. Which begs the question, I mean, as Mary always says, our budgets are not only expenses, they're revenues. Yep. So why do we do this revenue change mid, it, I mean, we've probably done it for thousands of years, but why do we do it at this time as opposed to during the budget season? Yeah, I don't like saying this is the way we always did it. That's not a good. I, I don't. I, I really don't well, like that. Well, I think that, that you that did approach. project uh, fees. Yeah, 
fee increases as part of your rep closing the gap. Yeah, it, that was projected. this this was really I, I think yeah there was a little more urgency you know with this one to, to you know to close the gap. I think the other thing it allows you to do get is you get closer, particularly uh, you know like, you know golf for example. Most golf courses are, are all making their fee changes at the same time, and it okay. gives us the chance to say okay where where are we compared to them, and what you know what are uh, you know things going on? What are your operating that costs? That makes sense. So, so being closer to it does make it you know yeah. uh, a little easier. Yeah, no, no, I question. appreciate, and that's a, actually a great explanation because, yeah. and otherwise it might be, you, you would wonder why, but that's actually a wonderful yeah. explanation. Right. So, I mean, I, you know, if this board feels the fees are not numerically that high, I'm, I'm not thrilled doing it piecemeal, but if you feel that you need this and you budgeted for it, you planned on having an increase to meet your budget, right. is that right? Yes. Then you know I'm not. In, I won't vote against it. But I absolutely think we need to take more comprehensive, and we need to start looking at it now. So I would really encourage the subcommittee to meet as soon as possible, and let's get this ball rolling. Um, we have, have some long-term yeah. solutions that need to be solved. Have you already notified the high school that of your proposed fee, so yes. they can add it to the pay-for-play? Because that's coming it, up. It's in a not few. enough to really make a difference for them. Well, I don't know. For the hockey program, they're they're going to tack it on. They're they're going to have to absorb increases at other rinks as well. Yeah, so I know. Well, that's what I mean. They're they're going to be what looking at a lot. Yeah. Happens, you know, but it, it, Jerry did speak. I did speak with Dane, mm -hmm. and Jerry did speak with Dane Street, who's the athletic director. And I did mm -hmm. ask him, and he Dane did raise the point, which I think is a valid one, which I think needs to be addressed by the comprehensive committee. What is the, what are we doing here? Robbing Peter to pay Paul, and how are we sharing expenses and costs for things? that are jointly used and we do need to look at the broader picture of that yeah, he, he did that he did Dane did tell me he thought they could absorb the price increase but you know every increase as Cheryl knows with hockey mm -hmm. um, they the pay for play for that is quite a bit more than yep. it is for a normal sport so it is it's an it's impact. not higher than a crew teams I'll tell you that and we did <laughs> and we did actually deny it what was the last fee that came to us it was the for girl the, the golf team I think it was yeah. the, the girls team. golf team we did deny it on principle for that same reason. Yeah, I well, think that, the difference so here is that there is um, a higher, higher maintenance. maintenance cost. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. you know, again, it would it would be whether, because it's on the town side of the budget, Yeah. Um, you know, you have all the taxpayers in town paying for the ice time for maybe a small group of, of people that and are also, playing Jerry, hockey. And also, Jerry, you, so you made, balance. and Jerry made the point that in the past, yeah. increases have been talked about with the high school. That's oh, yeah. part, can you explain that? Yeah, just that, well, going way back, I think when, you know, uh, and again, not because it's always done this way, but the, you know, since the, the rink was built in 1972, the, you know, the Board of Ed has always paid an hourly uh, fee. And when the, the rink was rebuilt in 1999, it was done with the commitment, you know, from uh, the high school athletic department and the Board of Education that they would pay the hourly fee that we laid out with the understanding it would be less than they pay at, at ISCC. And, and we've stayed within that, you know, we, we, we've honored that and, and um, you know, Dane, and, and the athletic, uh, you know, department, they, un they understand that. Um, I think we are actually a more affordable option, you know, for them. And but that was part of the agreement exactly. when the, that the contingent the rink got built And it is similar to what's done, um, what the arrangements are with the soccer club, because the soccer club does maintain the cost of the soccer field, so yep. for the users and the um, baseball fields as well. The maintenance fees that are charged um, by the fields, again, it gets it gets back to what's the basic level of services you're offering everybody in town Correct. and then what are the additional level of services are required right. by the teams that they're willing to subsidize and i think that's you know as long as we can keep to that conversation i think it's a fair analysis and to mm -hmm. jerry's point i mean we do the library does give all their programming is free all their services are free and that's something we fund because we see value in it and then we need to evaluate what what are our core uh, services we offer from Parks and Rec that we have to ask taxpayers to fund because right. we view it as a core service. Exactly. And, th and that's part of the comprehensive right. thing. So there are a lot of big issues out there that I think we need to look at. And I, and I am concerned about piecemealing it, but I won't object if this board to feels that strongly. End. I Thanks move that we... Uh, one, one oh, sorry. Line. Yes, the, the charge that the subcommittee was given was not to look at the individual fees other than from a 10,000 foot view to say, are you making enough money off of those fees? I think setting the fees sooner in the year would be better for everybody, makes everybody much easier to, to do your budgets. Um, I 
have to agree with Sean. I can't see us getting this done in the next four weeks and to hold off uh, the, the, to get the recommendation back from that subcommittee um, and to hold off on these fees, I really don't think is fair to the mm -hmm. groups. E either we should agree of no increase, which frankly will turn around and hurt us, in, in my opinion, when we have to do something next year or take a, a small step here, even though it's maybe not uh, even dollar figures all the way around, they are even increases, which sometimes you've got to do. And that does affect the percentages. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, I was not aware that the subcommittee wasn't going to look at fees, because I don't know how you look at revenue and expenditures without looking at what you're charging. So um, I would be inclined to refer this to the subcommittee if they choose not to take this issue up. And I think the Board of Selectmen needs to do it ourselves, right. because somebody needs to do it. So if the subcommittee is not going to do it, then Nobody said the subcommittee wasn't going to do it. But Mike that, just that, said wasn't, that wasn't the that wasn't the original charge. It doesn't mean we're not going to do well, it. I, but that I'm wasn't saying, the charge. I'm I mean, saying I want to go ask the subcommittee if they want to do it or not because mm -hmm. my understanding for me you can't really look at a revenue and a deficit situation without looking at what you're charging in fees. It's it's a logical. I just don't know how you have that conversation about. To how clarify, much we looked at fees in totality, not not if we were right. charging three dollars for somebody to walk well, on for 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 and, Friday and night. I, skate. I think fair, I think the other you've got two members of the Park and Rec Commission on that group, and I think it's yeah, it's probably so a little more incumbent you, on them to be able to say you know how we arrive and what yeah, the justification is. Yeah, and I'm saying if the subcommittee doesn't have fees. the time or inclination to do it, that's fine. I just would like to come back to the board of selectmen so we could have a conversation about who is going to look at it because I I agree with Lisa. I think it needs to be looked at. Mary, nobody said the board the, the, the subcommittee doesn't have the time to do it. No, I was just following up on what Mike said. That he they didn't say we didn't have time to do it. He wouldn't have the time over the next four weeks. Four weeks. Say. In the yeah. next four weeks to, oh, okay. to look at to the do individual do fees and come back with a no, number. No. Okay. With, with a number. That on the this thing. On this Park and Rec has also approved. It's not going to get done in four weeks. But we are looking at the total package and a gross revenue number. Maybe that's a better way to put it, Jerry, of where they're their shortfall is. Okay. We're not looking at whether it's three dollars for a Friday night skate or four dollars. Well, I, I guess just to clarify, I, I'm not saying we should wait for this particular item. What I'm saying is that it would be. I would like to know whether the subcommittee is going to look at the fees charged, and if they're not, then we'd look at it somewhere else. That's that's my only point. Not. I agree with you. Not for this particular issue because you're not going to be able to do that in four weeks. No. In order, but um, and, and if the subcommittee doesn't want to, or I'd like to refer to them and ask them whether they want it. Would be willing to look at that. And I will do just that. Thank I will make you. a motion to approve the fees as presented this evening and to refer to the subcommittee Thank for further you. consideration as part of the comprehensive plan. I will second that. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? No. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. All right, Thank the next you. item, Jerry, just stay right where you are because you're up to uh, yeah. open space fund. So uh, the next item, I want to thank the Board of Selectmen uh, for joining the Board of Finance. Um, on uh, discussing the open space fund. Uh, Jerry's been working hard with Jeff and Tom Roy on really addressing uh, comprehensively our uh, long-term open space needs. Um, the document before you is the same document uh, that we submitted to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance during the joint uh, meeting with um, an additional information that was uh, um, requested by both boards, which is to come up with an um, open space fund policy. So how is this money going to be used? And I think um, the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance uh, both have the same intent, and the board can speak for themselves, and that is really to take a comprehensive look on how we fund open space, but also to make sure that we're not putting money in that's going to be used maybe for purposes that um, the board doesn't feel comfortable with, or what happens when um, there's a lot of funds in place um, that maybe the board wants to reallocate. So um, I want to thank Joe and Jerry for putting together um, the open space fund policy. Uh, there was a recommendation in the short term, and that's what I'd like to, um, since the board this is the first time the board saw the policy, I'm sure you're not ready to act on the policy itself. But um, what you have seen before is the request um, for some short term needs. And if you look at fiscal year 2015, um, since there was the sale of Phyllis Farm, there was additional revenue that did come from the town. Um, there was a request uh, for the Ethel Walker Consultant Services, which Jerry can talk about, which we'd like to do and put in place before the town acquires it so that we can make sure that um, all of the safety and improvements are in place. Um, the Ethel Walker Improvements, the Forest Ma Management Plan Administration, which will be basically um, Forest Management Plan, which will generate revenue and timber management. 
and um, and then Jerry highlighted uh, the items in 2015 uh, that he he was requesting. The board also asked for a process to uh, look at uh, possibly uh, dr addressing the Dewey Farm uh, property. The town, town was looking at um, what the history of the Dewey Farm property was and what options the board might have uh, moving forward on that property as well. So uh, with that introduction, Jerry, I don't know if you want to just quickly walk through or Joe, uh, walk through uh, the policy. Or the sure. and, and I don't know if you, if you want to uh, discuss for Joe. Joe worked uh, on uh, the, the language uh, for the establishment of the fund. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if they, if they have that, but they, 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 that's they, part, of your, yes. part of your pack as well. But just going back, um, yeah, the, you know, my memo uh, really outlines some of the key areas that, you know, we'd like to see addressed. One, um, uh, the forest management plans, which, you know, we got the first draft of today on, on the initial plan, and we'd like to move forward with the uh, uh, the harvesting process on that, to, as Mary said, it's a, it is a, a revenue uh, generator, um, uh, or at the very least, a revenue neutral um, program. Um, the only thing we'd be looking there would be the uh, the six thousand dollars is the, is the the seed money to to get that started. That again is on the high side, but but nonetheless, that was uh, you know one of the things that we were we're looking for. The the bigger one, I think, from 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 my standpoint or from the department standpoint, um, as you recall, two years ago, the uh, uh, line item in, in the park and open space uh, budget uh, for facility maintenance was eliminated. At the time, there was discussion that when this uh, transaction took place, that that money would be uh, reapportioned to the budget. Um, I think uh, 10,000 of that has been um, resubmitted in the budget uh, for trail maintenance. Um, so it leaves a, r the remaining 25,000. I tried to go back and look at a, a you know, give you a five-year history of typically where that that money's been expended, and and, and that's detailed uh, between open space, tree work, uh, fence work, irrigation repair and service, uh, roadway and lighting repairs, and, and playground surfacing. Um, Ethel Walker Open Space, uh, uh, as you know, a, a um, proposal was sought uh, from a consultant to assist in the transition um, uh, of that property from uh, to the town. Uh, we we do have a proposal uh, in hand that will, you know, help us with the transition in terms of uh, uh, the things that we need, you know, to make that that park or that that open space piece uh, accessible, uh, you know, to the public. Um, uh, we've estimated a you know a yearly uh, yearly maintenance cost uh, for the property. Um, there are a number of startup areas, particularly with parking and signage and uh, things like that, that that do need to be addressed up front. Um, and lastly, just the uh, the area uh, of the pond in Belden Forest uh, that abuts the library. Uh, we've had the uh, uh, management of Metro Beast has expressed interest in partnering with the town to clean that area up. Uh, there is, I think, a lot of potential there. Uh, the very historic, a lot of historic, uh, you know, significance down there. And I, I think you go back to when, uh, you know, that house was, you know, was, was uh, you know, was lived in. Uh, I think it was a very, you know, very popular area, and it was very, uh, uh, you know, an area that I think really could be restored to. Uh, to really, you know, make it, uh, you know, the place that would be desirable to, you know, for people to use. So, those are some of the key areas. I think we've also given a, a budget that included some other um, proposed improvements uh, for the first year or first three or the three-year projection. And, um, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Questions. Start at the end and go right down. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, something that we talked a lot about at the joint meeting was the consulting services. Obviously, that's kind of a short fuse. So, thirty-three. That's the thirty-three thousand, and then the the eighty thousand we have for Ethel Walker improvements. That's correct. Aren't we paying the consultant to tell us how much the improvements are going to cost? Well, we are. Uh, so, how do we know it's eighty thousand already? That's that's an estimate that we're okay. that yeah, we so put in there. Yeah, the okay. 33 is the short term. And okay, the, yeah. so I, and that's exactly what I'm getting right. confused. The other so. is the longer term. Okay. So if you're looking to, to pick a menu, um, you're, I think what you're, I think like what you're going menu. is, you know, what what really is short term needs right. right now? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's short term, long term, item one on the last chart is, is short term. Item two is probably we get back together after the consultant tells us what we really got to yeah. do down there. Correct. Okay. 
and then I, I don't know if this is going to be unpopular or not, but my, my feeling is, yeah, we, we absolutely need to get the open space, you know, short-term repairs back in there for trails and everything else. I don't think it should be done in a special revenue fund. Those are those are operating expenditures. And once, like we learned with Simsbury Farms, once the money's gone, we've got to make that hole through a budget transfer at the end. And that's that's not a good way to tackle that. I agree with you, we've got to put money in there. But that's probably part of another comprehensive conversation that we're having here is looking at how do we pay for open space? Does it go in operating? Does it go in these funds? Is it truly just going to be acquisition and extracurricular maintenance, you know, improvement outside of, you know, what you folks do every day? And I just want to make sure that we're all kind of thinking about that because whatever we put into this fund, when the money's gone in five years or 10 years, if we don't find a way to continue to fund it, and maybe that's how we solve it, we give it money every year. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think I we got to be real careful with those yeah. decisions. Just if I could just explain, um, I think where your your point, and I think it's a good one, is that uh, what you see number one is Ethel Walker Consulting Services. That's the plan that um, that Malone and McBroom would would perform, which would yep. tell us what the annual right. operating costs versus the maintenance costs uh, would yeah. be. And I think I can see yeah. your point. What needs to be in the budget? What needs to be uh, something longer term or capital? And that's just rather Walker. And then I'm going even bigger picture because exactly. Jerry's got hundreds of other well, acres. So he if you look at number, so looking at number three, the forest management plan administration, I think that gets to your point where authorizing those funds will tell us the amount of revenue we can get from that for a timber plan and yep. then go back in. So that's one of your short term yep. just to go through. The next item is the open space management plan and I think that the purpose of that, and Jerry could explain that, is to, to get up get enough information to have someone with some expertise, because again, we're operating open space with park and rec programs. Yep. So the point of that would be to, to tell us what really we should be budgeting on the annual budget. Right Absolutely. now we're, we're guesstimating, we're changing yep. it, we're, you know, we're finding that we eliminated money, then next year mm -hmm. we needed more. Yep. So I think it's to try to get us a stable uh, budgeting number. I agree. Uh, the same thing with the um, bike trail maintenance plan, and I think uh, Tom can talk to that. You know, we really, uh, the original bike trail that, um, you know, the Board of Selectmen and Peggy Shanks had the foresight to do is the Iron Horse Boulevard piece now is 20 years old. Mm. And, you know, we really need to look at if we're going to be a, bike friendly community and say that we want people to use our trails how how are we going to make sure that we keep people safe so mm. though know. that fund was get to get to your point it wasn't a short-term repair it's really a planning tool yep no, um to give you know the boards of selectmen going forward the information they need on what they should be funding absolutely and um, mary and if then, i could just jump in with yep. one just to, you to put your mind at ease yep. so despite the prior debate and our, the tortoise pace of our uh, our subcommittee that is one of the things we are talking about is looking at recreation in totality and that might be pushing the scope a little bit but this whole topic kind of bled into that because yep. what we learned through those studies is we spend significantly less in this town than um, Glastonbury and I believe we have a comparable amount of open space and parks mm -hmm. um, you know and, and Avon it's it's quite staggering when you look at that and we should probably share that information that we've kind of had with this board to, to give you guys a good idea of what you know Mike and I and the rest of us are looking at and you know, not that we've been wrong, but we've never kind of pulled back and, and looked at this type of open space as recreation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's there's a significant delta in the funding. I don't know if it's right or wrong, right. Um, but that's part of what we're looking at. And that's why it's taken so long, yep. it, no, I in I part and parcel, it. to kind of make sure that whatever we do and send back to this board is going to look at this town in its entirety. 33% of it is open space, right? And that's that's a significant responsibility. And with that comes cost, as we're, we're, we're experiencing now. So it's, uh, I'm all for, um, you know, the, the short-term, um, you know, consultants, and I don't love consultants, but in, in this case, we've got to do it because we have a significant amount of, of money that we're going to have to spend on this for health reasons, for recreation reasons, for a lot of reasons. And if we don't make the right decisions and experts tell us what we should do, we're going to be spending money on things we shouldn't be. So this is spend a little now to save some and, and be more intelligent in the future. So uh, again, don't take my, my comments to mean I'm not in favor of any of this. I no, very no, much I was am. just trying to explain yeah. it. You mm -hmm. know, um, yep. obviously we're not coming here and asking you to transfer $464,000, which is which is really the amount of revenue that came in for open space. Right. And the purpose of the open space fund was to take that money, not tax our residents, yep. but to use the revenue to offset the expenditure. So yep. given that number, 
um, you know, we had staff put together a budget as to how it could be used for open space. And some mm -hmm. of it includes um, short-term needs. We don't have the expertise in-house to look at the Ethel Walker property and, mm -hmm. and tell you uh, where the runoff is, where the erosion is, where all those, <coughs> you know, the uh, diseased trees are. So that's why it needs to be done by someone with some expertise. Same thing with the forest management plan. We, we don't have the capacity in-house. Now, right. maybe we need a forester. And, you know, I don't know, 33% of the town's open space. You know, you start to look at what your staff capacity is. But at this point, we don't have the expertise in-house to do that. So mm -hmm. there are some things, and I think you hit on those, Sean, that, that we really would like to do now yep. that will help us uh, when we get to next year's budget um, do a better job of budgeting mm -hmm. uh, for what our needs are. Um, can I go to the next? Um, the bike trail short-term repairs are, those are in addition to the $10,000 for the greenway maintenance. And is there any differentiation between that? In the, I mean, we have the $10,000 in the budget. Yeah, so 5000 is for the plan. That's the paper management plan, the same that we do for our roadways. We've recently started doing that for the bike paths. I think Jerry also did but a line I, item yeah. for 15000 That was for um, replacing fences and other items that you had said you wanted to do. Yeah. But this is putting it into a special revenue fund and not putting it in the budget? It's an addition. They're going to be two separate Correct. items, both working on the right. trail maintenance. I, I have number five is coming up with a long term plan. What is okay. it going to cost annually and how many miles of bike path do we need to repave or recondition every I year? guess my question is how, why do we divide that up? I mean, why is some of it in the operating budget and why is the, some of it in the special revenue fund for open space? Um, the $5,000 piece is going to be strictly consulting services, where the $15,000 is actual construction that's going to occur right okay. that's a you know that's that's a good point i think the purpose of the purpose of the line item again which is the longer term needs that we're not going to pay right now right uh yeah. the purpose was to show that you know that that the short-term repairs were were not were underfunded in the in the ten thousand line item. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's to show highlight that but if you're looking at the the needs right now it is really to put the bike trail maintenance plan on the same wonderful program that tom has done for the um paving of the roads yeah. and what we did is we took um uh, you know yeah. and and the board's familiar because we've talked yeah. about it in oh, yeah. budget you know all yeah. of the roads right. and the condition of all the roads and then put it on an annual cost that we could then fund and and uh, mm -hmm. we wanted to do the same thing with the bike trail i i don't disagree with you on that my only question was where it's going to appear in yep. the budget yep. so and you're more talking about item five than item four right? yes right? well so item four is the is the plan, plan. item well, five is spending the dollars on doing the repairs itself. Uh, well, no, actually, I was I was comparing. I was seven and you're right. Yeah, four I was and talking six are the about plans. the short term repairs and seven the and ten thousand dollars that's already in the budget over here yep. for greenway okay. maintenance. Yeah. Are you done? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep the flow going here. Um, on the front, the first page of your memo, Jerry, the um, current budget of ten, and then your list below of twenty five. So. Is the 25 in addition to the 10 you already have? That's your... your exactly. That was a $35,000 <clears> line item. Right. Yeah. I do recall and, that. And 10 of it was restored. And that was the 10 that goes specifically towards trail maintenance. Okay. And that's number five in this list, correct? Is that... Uh, yes. Yes. 25 that was not restored. That's correct. And okay. I, I guess I just helped Jerry on this one because... Um, the storms that we've had had a significant impact on our tree work. And so what you're really looking at, we did restore, and I thank the Board of Selectmen for restoring additional funding for tree repair, but it's just still not enough. And I think what Jerry's concern is and Tom's concern is that any additional money that we can get, um, we could spend on trees. And so that was, I know that's important to you, Jerry, so I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Because it, it is money that is needed you know yeah I, and i can during a storm yeah I, I could just cite you know an example i mean i, I think you know rich Sawitsky talks about it all the time with the you know with the greenway one of the the, the great features about it is you know the, the tree canopy and you know it, it really is but with that comes you know a maintenance cost and when we just did that uh uh that section from west mountain road to town forest about point about seven tenths of a mile um and you know we we as part of that we did the uh uh we brought a, a a tree contractor in to do you know what we felt was the minimum really needed to be done and um 
that was uh, just in excess of $6,000. Now, that's seven-tenths of a mile. Now, nothing had been done in there for, you know, for quite, other than when we had storm damage and, and things like that. But, you know, you've got, you know, in addition to the open space, I mean, the Greenway is, you know, many, you know, it's, a, it's really a, 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 I don't want to say densely forested, but it's a heavily wooded, you know, yeah. area along there. And, and it's, I think it's a real concern that we have with the, uh, you know, with the, with the traffic that it gets and with the, the mm -hmm. condition of the trees. I think it, it really needs to be more, we look at it, it really needs more of an ongoing program. It can't be a one time, you know, you know, just go through and, or wait till, you know, the worst. And, and then all of a sudden say, oh, gee, you know, we should have, we should have been more aggressive with this. So. So I but guess I, I saw, yeah, to agree with Mary, I, I, I think it is an emphasis, you know, for us yeah. that we need to look at. And certainly I completely understand the, you know, um, sort of unexpected weather conditions and the need for safety and all of those things. Um, and I think the monies against plans here to get a better understanding against cost is good. My concern is putting operating expenses so you get a plan the plan tells you that every year you need to be doing this this and that and then three years out from now and again i know we're only talking about 2015 right now but we've used up all of our money so uh, we need to find a way as painful as it is that once we have these plans to build this in because we own this and we do want to maintain it but we're not going to be given four hundred and sixty four thousand dollars every three years to make that happen and so um, my inclination would be one <coughs> one four and six um, and I, I don't know where we go until we have a better understanding of the plans. I, I know there's 25 here that we need to do. That would I be on the fence on that one, to no pun intended. Um, but the other stuff, I I'm just struggling a little bit with adding those things in. They weren't in our budget because we didn't have the money to right. fund them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think the, pro the, the reason for the open space fund is because we're not going to tax it. We're not going to put these in our operating budget because mm -hmm. we don't have the money. We can't ask people to pay more. So we have to come up with creative ways uh, to go after grants, to go after timber management. That's why I think number three is so important because... Excuse me, I meant that too. I apologize. Okay. I yeah, yeah, thank you. Because yeah. um, yeah. I think that that's really important for us to implement. We did do it. We did it, and then for a number of years, the town didn't do it. And so you lost that opportunity to use the revenue from the timber to help fund um, open space. So, so I think, you know, certainly uh, it's not going to be in the operating budget because we can't add this amount of money into our operating budget mm -hmm. and ask taxpayers to pay Absolutely. for it. So we, we really need to find another way. Lisa. It, I, is it okay if I shift gears to the actual open space fund language? Yeah, I'll just ask if anybody else has any other questions on the line items as well. Um, Mike, do you I'm, have any questions? I'm not prepared to, to vote on the language tonight. I don't have a problem having a discussion yeah. with it. Um, I really am having a problem with taking this fund and in three years going through all these dollars to both fund the plan and then now use the monies for operations. I, I don't disagree with your concern or the point you made, Mary, that where are we going to get these dollars? But <coughs> we bought at the Walker Woods. What were we thinking we were going to do with it? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not trying to be a yeah, smart well, aleck, but how are we going to maintain well, it? Well, you know, quite honestly, I wasn't here when uh, the, the uh, proposal was made and the contract was signed. But um, what you're seeing in most towns now is that uh, when open space is acquired, there is a component of maintenance in it. Yeah. And that component was not included in, in the other walker. Yeah. So I think it would be unfair to our citizens and unfair to our staff to say, okay, the town gave you the money to buy it. You figure out. I'm not giving you any more money, and you figure out. And I know you don't mean that, but, I'm, but the point is well taken that, you know, you dump 400 acres of open space on a staff of one, and you say, hey, <laughs> out of boy, Jerry. Good luck with that. Put your chains on. Go at it. I think, I, think, I think it's really important to have this conversation. It's two guys. Really? Well, no, Tom's highway. You know, so there's no highways. I don't know. He's a tree no warden. Either. He's a tree warden. So you know, I, I think this is a reality yeah. check there's because no I think that there. you know, it's great to say we want our, yeah. you know, we want our bike pass and we want our open space. But hey, folks, somebody's got to pay for it, or we might as well sell it because we can't, we cannot maintain the open space. Excuse we have. us, please. We, you know, we cannot op maintain the open space that we have with the dollars. You, you just I can't agree. do it. You can't budget $10,000 and say, you know, good luck 
uh, operating 33% of the town. Yeah, Mary, so you're, you're I think we all recognize that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So yeah. the question is, how do we um, fund it? And we're all trying to find our way. And I yeah. think the Open Space Fund is an attempt to do that, to say, um, you know, we need to get a handle on how we're going to keep these properties safe, uh, what, how much active and passive recreation we want to have, and how we're going to pay for it. And I think that some of the tools that, that Jerry's proposed tonight are going to be helpful in having us do that, because there are experts that are going to be able to say, um, you know, in order to, to operate a 400 you know, you, it needs either to be passive recreation, which is going to generate this cost, or it's going to be active and it'll generate that cost. So we can have that public conversation. But, you know, we're trying to find our way. You know, right now, there's no money budgeted. And we had this wonderful gift we hadn't anticipated sell. We didn't have Ferris Farm on the market. You know, we didn't put a for sale sign on. It was something that, you know, the Land Trust, which is a great partner, came to us and said, uh, we have a way to keep this in open space and give you some revenue. And, and fortunately, the public supported us in doing that. And so we voted, and, um, and we did that. So we have this gift of an additional 464000 in revenue that we didn't anticipate that is a gift because of the sale of open space that we have to have an honest, serious conversation about not squandering that money and putting it back and not then taxing residents next year, but using it for the purpose it was intended, which is to offset the cost of open space. And I think that's what we're trying to do here, Mike. You know, not. Not each of these line items need to be funded today, and I think we had a lot of great discussion about that. But yep. um, we need to get started in, 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 in talking about taking care of the open space, and this is no one way to do it. The open space policy needs, needs work because this is the first time we've seen it. We've got to send it to the Board of Finance. They need to be comfortable with it. Our finance director needs to be comfortable with it. Our taxpayers need to be com comfortable with it. But it, it gives a way to generate some gifts. So if people really like open space, we now have a mechanism to say, well, you know, you can donate. If you like that trail, you can donate to keeping that trail um, in good shape for other people. So, you know, it's, it's an attempt to just really have that hard conversation is, you know, yeah, the town gave us all the money to buy it. Now, we, how are we going to fix it? And yep. how are we going to take care of it? Start. If I could, I, I just want to make sure everybody can hear everybody, if I could just have Thank quiet. You. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, can we, can we, around the, um, and I'll keep going back to these numbers here, but the, the plans are outlined, the consulting, number three, number four, number six. How long would it take for us to get through these plans so that we would end up with something that would give us a real hard look at um, what, what needed to be done in totality and on an annual basis? Well, I, I would, I mean, I would think you'd want to gear things uh, towards the next budget process. I right. think you, you, you want well, I to think, I think, Jeff, I think the question is, if the board were to vote tonight and the Board of Finance were to vote tonight, how quickly could we get uh, plans the plans done. done and back to the board of selectmen? As far as the, I'd say another walk or three to four months, depending on how many committees were involved. So that would be in time process. for the budget process. Yeah, yeah, close, but yeah, it'd be close. But yeah. And then on this, um, actually, I put this in as far as the plans go, but as far as the forestry and timber management, is there a way to sort of, you know, put that seed money in and undertake that and, and get some determination on the type of revenue? That we can start to see coming yeah, yes, out. Yes, I will tell you that the project, as I said, I got the, the, the draft today for the first uh, uh, plan that will um, actually initiate that, that initial harvesting, which we want to have done or begin late fall. Um, anyway, so we'll have that number. Uh, we'll have that number in hand as we're going when the you know when the budget's submitted, as well as you know hopefully some of the improvements that you know would would be be okay. able to be go along with that. Yeah. So. So I, I think with that timing and knowledge of understanding what we could have for a plan and then what we could have for a potential other source of revenue, I, I would feel comfortable making a motion to approve one, three, five, and six at this point. One, three, four. Uh, one, three, four, four. Four and six. I'm sorry. Um, and not five. And not five. Is there a second to the motion? There well, is. I, actually, I haven't. Had a chance to oh. ask my question. All right, well, there's a motion on the table. Let me just uh, get a second. And, I do a second, um, and can I second, comment on that? And then discussion. Second? Lisa. I, I, I wanted to get to the actual <laughs> open space policy, because yes, if apologize. we're going to put it in somewhere, I think we need to have a conversation about yes. what it is. Well, right now it's in the general fund, so we don't need to have the policy to do this motion this evening. You could transfer the funds. I think your motion yeah. was to transfer the funds. That, it's in the general fund right now. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Exactly that. Right. Clear. Thank you. Yep. So it's not to put it in the open space fund, it's to transfer it. So if you and just, the open space fund. I agree with you. We need to talk about that. Can we do that as a separate discussion? Can we just yeah. and finish this part first? If we can have that discussion tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Can I yeah. Yeah. You can okay. certainly, 
it, the floor is yours. So if you want, go for it. If you want to have a question on the policy, have, and we can do that. No, I don't mind voting on the um, motion before us because I, I okay. and I agree with um, Nancy and Sean and actually everyone on this board. When you have a gift, and the Board of Ed just did that when they received the gift from the McAllen Fund, is you want to make sure it doesn't go into operating costs. And they most boards do have a policy. You don't use grants for operating expenses because when the grant goes away, exactly, what You're do stuck. you do? Mm -hmm. So that's that's a clear guideline that we need to look at. And mm -hmm. the plans, which is why I support Nancy's motion, um, are one-time expenses that will lay out process. They're not ongoing expenses. So that's consistent with that. Okay, so I will support that. I do have a number of questions about the actual open space fund, and we're going to recommend that. So that I'd like to have a discussion on that. Yeah. Thank okay. you. If I could just add a Thomas. comment. Yeah. So we're looking at um, forty-nine thousand right now mm -hmm. for these. I marked them as S. So these are yeah. short term. Correct. And then we've got some maintenance items, and I'll, we'll address this in a second, I think. But I think we ought to give due consideration tonight too to those short term repairs. Um, for which is item five, um, based on our prior discussions, and with the understand and again, my understanding, everybody's free to do it, but that we need to revisit that as part of the budgetary process. And this is, in my mind, a one-time thing tonight um, from the short-term repairs because that's that's the only M I have where I'm willing to go down that road. So, I'm sorry, do you want to amend the motion? No, I do not, that? but I, I want to take it up separately because okay, I don't want to okay. I don't want to mess things up. Okay. And I'm just mm -hmm. telling everybody where my head yeah. is. So, okay, I appreciate that. I just uh, <laughs> just to follow up on that, Sean. I. Uh, I think we're all trying to get to the same place, and yep. that is yep. to try to distinguish between what is um, an investment and a gift, and how we maintain open space, and and then how we, um, we we do best practices, and that's what we're trying to do. And I think this is going to go a long way in helping us do that and giving us the tools that we need. Um, so I think that's great. The uh, yeah, I think it's great. I think it's a great conversation. I think it's important. So, uh, mm -hmm. so we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Sean, would you like to make your second motion? I would. So um, I, I would like us to consider, and I'll, I'll move that we approve uh, a transfer of 25000 for item 5, which is the Parking Recreation Open Space Short-Term Fund repairs, um, again, in recognition of the fact that we have a significant amount of maintenance that we simply have to do. Um, I do view that as an operating item, which is why I'd rather do it now okay. out of um, reserves versus when we do create this fund and do officially move in there. Because I think once we do that, we're, we need to, that's when we need to have the revenue and, and all those other okay. conversations. And I'm, I'm willing to consider it this evening, um, provided the finance director has no concerns with us transferring all this money. Are you comfortable? <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to try and appropriate that from fiscal 14. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And um, I know Lisa wants to, let me just explain the process on the open space fund. And again, Jerry and uh, Joe, thanks for getting us started because I think the, the joint meeting was very helpful. Everybody wants to know uh, if we get a gift, how do we encourage people to give gifts? How do we encourage us to go after grants? Because that's an incentive so that we don't have uh, tax dollars going to maintain the open space. Um, as, as much as we can offset it. So the question is, um, if folks have, I'd like to refer this to the Board of Finance, then have it come back to us with their comments. Um, if anyone has any specific comments, and I know Lisa, you do, why don't we get those on the record so that the Board of Finance will have those um, observations and then we can have, circle back. I'd also like to refer this uh, to the Open Space Committee and they, they'll be having a meeting on Wednesday. So I'll also be gathering uh, some input from uh, those folks as well. So, Lisa. All right. So, uh, Joe, thank you for putting this together. Um, I did have a few questions for you. One, I appreciate the effort you put into it and um, the thoughtfulness. And I think what you were trying to do. One question I had, and I just want to make sure that this, when you think open space fund policy, and it goes back to Sean's position, it shouldn't be for maintenance and operating costs generally. That would are ordinarily part of our budget. I would actually. I know you. I, would I know you would disagree. From a philosophical standpoint. Well, uh, let me get to where I'm going. In it, you talk about open space being athletic facilities, public indoor recreation, and that's not what I view as open space. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. I mean, you guys can designate it however you guys see fit. Um, I tried to leave the language as vague as possible, and Cheryl actually did give me a, a, a little bit of. A correction of where I had to open it up a little bit. Um, 
you're still going to have to go through a planning process where you're going to have to approve this budget, very similar to what you do with Simsbury Farms. So I left it as open as possible. Let's say you guys buy a new open space and you're going to put a soccer field in, you're going to put a football field in, you're moving the high school, you're putting a new stadium in. This, this will kind of create a little bit more room for you guys if you have those funds available. Um, so you could build, under your definition, just I'm sorry to follow up on yours, yeah. you could build an indoor soccer. Uh, that's, but that would allow it. That's what you're saying. Just wanted and to make that, the argument, yes. Yeah. And I, I guess I would say I'm not comfortable going there yet. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'll think about it, and I'm certainly here about it, but that's not what I view as open space. Um, and I, I saw, and I would like, a, I guess, a little more consideration of what towns do it like that. If I'd like to see best practices. And then in terms of you have the sale of any and all open space will result in the proceeds being placed in an open space fund. Right. And that's will not may well and is that because of the legal um implications of selling an open space or this is just nope, a parameter I, you put for it so what i'm trying to do is well yeah with that statement what i'm trying to do to you guys is encourage you guys to actually take a more active look at your open space get rid of properties that don't make sense to hold I and mean, we have small parcels all over the, all over the town i'd like to incentivize you guys and if if this does that we're incentivizing you guys and you guys know that you get to keep these funds to use for for purposes that you guys may deem necessary i think it's a decent tool to have no i i i don't doubt the value of it my concern is you know if you are in situations the board of finance has already said they may not necessarily want to designate it as there's something to be said for flexibility down the line for other boards who may disagree now that said if there's you know if we own a piece of property that we bought as open space and that was a condition of it and on the sale obviously it's conditioned to go be used for open space it does make sense to put it there but I and I'm not I haven't fully decided what I think about that but I have some concerns about that line as well Lisa, um, before you leave that can I just ask a yeah. follow-up question just just one the the will wording correct me if i'm wrong but doesn't any sale that we do have to go to the general fund and then be appropriated out of the general fund to open space? Have a policy that states it okay so that is that is the way around right. okay so mm -hmm. right now because we don't have that policy it, it has there. to go to the general yeah. fund like, but like if this fund were to exist the board of finance no longer gets to decide correct and a similar parallel to that would be think of a golf course right okay. golf course collects fees all day long yeah. they never go through the general fund they go directly to special revenue fund. okay excellent thank you other questions on the policy? Um, I think I I called right. Joe earlier and voiced some concerns about it, and I think Could you we, share those with we had board? a good discussion about it. Um, yeah, that's a, I had some concerns about the sale of the property language, um, which seemed to mandate that if we sold any of the property, that we would have to buy a property of at least equal fair market value or a reasonable equivalent of usefulness, size, and location to the land conveyed. And I thought that language limits our options um, yep. with how we would do it, particularly if we want to fund maintenance and forestry and other things like that. And I do not want to be held to buying additional properties. Yeah, so right. I, I we did have to maintain the ones that we have. have <laughs> yeah. no, and that's, 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 that's a great point. Uh, you know, we, we're probably not, I think the Open Space Committee has identified that we're not in the acquisition mode. There's right. no other parcels in the plan of uh, Open Space Plan of Conservation Development uh, section that um, the town has identified as, as, as wanting. There are parcels that have come up. Um, such as one that's on our executive session <laughs> that um, you know may be more valuable and maybe present itself as an opportunity in that case if the town deems that then they they are looking at mm. um, possibly uh, disposing of other open space right. property that may not be as valuable so that that would allow as, as Joe said the idea is to create incentive instead of us just buying all the property well it really causes us to go back and say well you know what we don't really need this anymore we may have may have been at a point in time where the town never owned, you know, when the town bought Dewey property, we didn't own any of the property in the center of town. Mm -hmm. And it's only because we actively went out and bought the Simsbury Meadows and bought the Baker property. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't own the center of town. So now that we do, um, you know, we revisit whether owning land that's not in the center still makes sense consistent mm -hmm. with what we are. So it just to give some perspective on. on um, and that was my point, it was just yeah. to leave us more flexibility yeah. and take out that shell will language okay thank you yep. um, Sean? just to point out one of the things i did like was was uh, section five the appropriation allocation of the fund 
which I think you know that's that's the standard check and balance that I think this town yeah. continues to to really enjoy that both this board and the board of finance yes. look at it independently. I hopefully that uh, that resonates with you know the voters and the taxpayers in this town that we've still got you know, a lot of folks looking at this to make sure that we're doing the right thing with these funds with with selling land. So I, I appreciated you putting that in there, and um, I, I did like the the. Um, broad definition of, of recreation in here in context with the rest of the discussions we're having in terms of how do we look at open space and recreation in this town. I don't know if this is the right place for it, but I, I do like it because I, I think it, it has an opportunity to work hand in hand with the Simsbury Farm Special Revenue Fund in terms of right. how do we look at it, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'd be hesitant to commingle that fund with other properties and, and soccer stadiums I'm not suggesting we would do that but whatever it may be boathouses whatever I'd like to more um, but <laughs> please don't but the, the, the point is 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 I think this this has an opportunity to be the right place for that to for both this board and the board of finance to, to look at you know open space and recreation in its totality as we uh, lumber along with our plan there so nice nice job I had to throw the fishing thing in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, just one question Joe to think about not to not to discussed tonight but um, is there flexibility built into here where um, you know we create this fund and there's there's assurance that that open space funds would go into this fund so the public will know that their gift to the town will actually be used for open space so it may generate some uh, estate gifts it may generate um, some uh, naming gifts you know I know we all love that but the point is would it provide enough flexibility that um, you know, let's say we grew this fund to a significant amount of money and we no longer needed to maybe budget in the operating budget for um, maintenance you know is there enough flexibility and, and not to answer tonight but just something to think about is there enough flexibility that we could expand uh, what we're funding under this fund yeah to the I mean a absolutely so right purpose of funds acquisition <laughs> development and or maintenance of lands for recreation and or conservation so yes you yeah. can because I do, I have noticed, and I know the board's noticed, we've accepted a lot of gifts, most recently, particularly in our social service department. With, um, you know, we started with the Eno Fund, and building Eno Hall was a gift. So, yeah. because we've been accepting a lot of gifts, you know, creating something like this may speak to a number of people who are committed to open space preservation, and we may be surprised at how much um, support this generates. Lisa. And the other thing I would add is, um, does this fund enable the ability to invest the money we get and create almost an endowment, a sustaining fund? I did put a statement in there on the interest, but... Uh, yes, it's Section 4, right? Yeah. Yeah, Something to think about when it comes back to us, Joe, if you okay. could take a look at that. I know the Board of Ed looked at that with the McGowan Fund. Was right. it worth investing it and generating income over time and building up an endowment so that it is self-sustaining? Exactly. Something to think about. Now, again, not to answer tonight, but yeah, I'm just thinking of the treatment, of accounting treatment of a special yeah. revenue fund. I don't think so, but I'll have to. Think but there may be another vehicle with which to. I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth at least considering. Or the question is, if it does it reach, Bonds you know, does it reach? Yeah. Um, does it reach a certain amount? Does that kick into an endowment? Let's say, for example, you know, we were to have. You know, you don't want to have a million dollars sitting in a fund. Right. Oh, right. So if but if it kicks over a certain amount, would that mm -hmm. would have, could we put a portion of that into a trust fund? I will Again, not to answer that. tonight, yep, but something to think yeah. about. Maybe the Board of Finance <laughs> needs to think about that. I'm sure yeah, Peter's they're... already. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Any other questions? Um, I just had, and I apologize because it was not at the July meeting, but um, discussion around the land trust and how that sort of works into all this I mean they are great stewards of the properties that they own and yeah they're um, they're having the same conversation you know we have a great relationship with the land trust and uh, Chuck Howard and I have had this conversation for six years about how the town and and Jerry knows we just went on a field trip um, and walked McLean with uh, Steve Payne to talk about um, how we're gonna work together to maintain open space whether it's town or land trust or uh, McLean you know we're really doing the same thing and they're really having the same conversation we are they're now building in uh, to their acquisition a cost of maintenance so they're fundraising the cost of uh, not only buying the property but also maintaining it and we did not do that with other Walker um, you know uh, but we're learning and we're we're, um, we're we're growing we would like to we've had conversations about um, and Jerry's had conversations about the land trust in the town having joint maintenance staff to um, maintain our open space. Yeah. The land trust not there yet. Um, they're not ready to have that conversation because they're still in acquisition mode. 
uh, they are really fundraising for Tanger Hill and they want to complete right. that. So um, we're constantly having that conversation. We're constantly looking at ways that we could share staff and share services. We've, we've improved a lot of the joint um, land trust and town um, services in terms of uh, sharing information and sharing, uh, you know, conversation about maintenance and signage and coordinating a lot of those. Land trust um, volunteers are now mapping Ethel Walker Wood trails for us for free. So there's a lot of sharing and cost uh, sharing, but we're we're n neither the town nor the land trust is ready to um, come up with a long-term plan, which 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 hopefully this will help us help do. Us do. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, comments? Did we have a motion and a second? We voted. We did not. Did we vote? We voted on um, We voted on yeah. everything. 25,000? Yep. Yeah. On the expenditure. Just wanted to make yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do we need to officially re refer that to the Board of no, Finance? No, it, it goes no. automatically. It can't, it can't be approved without Board of Finance approval, so we don't need to do it officially. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next item is to authorize the first selection to execute a two-year agreement with Pink here, and uh, the record will reflect that Mr. Payne removed himself from the discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Tom, you want to give a quick update? Um, back in October of 2013, mm -hmm. the state of Connecticut um, initiated the paint stewardship program, which basically means when you go to the hardware store and buy a can of paint, you pay a small fee which is put into a fund which is ultimately to provide for a disposal of the uh, unused portions of, of paint. Um, we all have moved into that house and you have that corner of the basement filled with the old blue paint and the red paint that maybe someday could match <laughs> Or you lived in your house way. for 20 years and you have a... <laughs> yeah, and we all think that someday we're going to need that paint to match up where the, and it never happens. Um, each and every year when we've had the household hazardous waste collection, one of the biggest things that we end up collecting are paint and stains. This is a great program where now at no cost to the town, we will be able to operate um, paint collection every single day that our landfill is open, awesome. and it will simply apply at no cost to our residents. Um, it's a great time to do it. We've waited a little bit just to let the program have some of the initial kinks and bugs work out. Um, with In July, we entered into a new three-year term with paint for the operation of the bulky waste facility. They've agreed to take on the responsibility of the actual collection of the paints and coordination with paint care for the pickups and delivery. There's a little bit of work there at no additional cost to the town. So essentially, there's just uh, nothing but good news on this. All of the paint is actually recycled. I, I did ask the question of what happens to the paint. Um, basically, they separate it out by colors. They screen it so yeah. they, some, some, somebody somewhere takes all the blue and pours them into one mm. bin and all the red into another. Um, they take all of that paint and they re-blend it, and it's used in commercial and institutional applications. Great, thank you. I also did look to see if we could buy some of that paint. Yeah, so. great, thank you. <laughs> I just mine's all dried up on the bottom of the can. They, they, they strain it. I, I got a whole lesson more than I, you want to know. <laughs> uh, two questions, Tom. One is, do you need a landfill permit? You do need a landfill permit, and so the reason you need the landfill permit is to basically verify your residency. The, so the, this the, is, so you, I, you can't just go? No. There are other, other places, many paint stores now, um, if you don't want to go through the trouble and expense of the $10 landfill permit, most paint stores um, will take the paint back from anybody. For free? For free. Okay. So, the, um, um, so folks will be told if they come and they don't have a permit that they have an option of getting the permit or they have the option of returning it to the paint store, paint uh, one, store. One, of, one of the participating okay. paint stores. And if you go to um, Paint Care's website, they have um, a mapping tool and, and you can find out where the nearest okay. um, facility is. Same thing is if a resident from another community wanted to bring paint to our landfill, it, it's not for them. It's only for Simsbury residents with an active landfill permit. Great. And um, when would, it's free. And when would the uh, when would the uh, when would this go into effect? How soon can you? As soon as we execute the agreement, they've already had. Um, You're looking at October first. That October would be 1st. without a doubt. Okay, so so in place by October first, just so if folks it have would, paint it, and they they're looking to get rid of it, they know in a few weeks we'll be ready to go. That that would actually be great because <laughs> um, November first is our fall household hazardous waste collection. So if we can have people who have paint come earlier to the landfill, it'll free up some of their uh, capacity at the uh, collection. Okay. Other questions, Lisa? Yeah. Is there a maximum amount of paint you can drop off? Uh, you can't be in containers larger than five gallons. But can you have like 50 five gallon? How you, many can you have? You, you can have as many individual cans of residential paint 
as, as you would have. Okay. There's, there's no upper limit. It, you can go it, buy some paint. You okay. can go, you can your go buy open, some. Um, <laughs> if you're trying to test out colors at home, yeah. go for it. <laughs> Great. But it, but there's a number of small requirements, and this is where um, the staff at the landfill does have to go through a training program, and it's it, it's pretty simple. But it's the paint has to be in the actual paint can; it can't be in jars, and yeah, you know they have to be able to identify it as it's what, uh, what it is. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any questions? Oh. We have a motion. I uh, will authorize the first selectman to execute to your agreement with Paint Care, a nonprofit 501c3 organization for the collection of paint primer and stains from our bulky waste facility on Wilkett Road in accordance with the State of Connecticut Paint Stewardship Program. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. Uh, next item is appointments and resignations to accept with regret and our thanks the resignation of Pam Lacko as a regular member of the Technology Task Force. Well, it's with deep regret, but yeah. sincere thanks. She did a phenomenal job. We were so lucky to have her, and she's left it in great shape. Um, I'll have some recommendations to you at the end of this meeting, but we are so pleased we had her for as long as we did, and uh, she's working on her book distribution. We're excited for her new endeavors. Thank her for her effort. So with that, I move that we accept the resignation. And I would. We will second that with thanks and regret as well. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next, is accept the resignation again with our thanks to Peter Kellogg <coughs> as a regular member of the Board of Ethics. Um, also, in keeping with the Board of Selectmen's policy, we do advertise for um, this has to be an unaffiliated member according to our rules. So we would advertise, and um, the Board of Selectmen has um, in the past in, uh, interviewed uh, folks, so that recommendation does not come from um, any particular party that comes from the Board of Selectmen. So, uh, the Board is comfortable. Uh, we just need a motion to accept the resignation. Mm -hmm. Move that. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Good, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next is to appoint Denise Alfeld with our thanks as an alternate member of the Stirk District Commission. Move that. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next is to appoint Alexandra Rice as a regular member of the Recycling Committee. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next is to appoint new members of the Technology Task Force um, as recommended by the Task Force Committee. I want to thank the Task Force again, Pam. They did put um, it out in the paper. They did um, spend a lot of time interviewing people who had some expertise and interest. Um, they did um, send a list to the Board of Selectmen for approval. The one question I would just ask, we do have one member who is not on a voter list, and I'm not sure if hmm. that person just, will have to register. That, so we'll just con make that one contingent upon the registering. I don't know what they'll register as. <laughs> it will, uh, as a good volunteer. <laughs> regardless of the registration, we're within the minority representation. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. Right. Thank you, Tom. And I appreciate that task force. They, when they interview it, they don't look at party registration all they look at qualifications and then you know mm -hmm. take, one person did not submit information made we may get another recommendation later on but they did accept everyone who applied as i understand great. is that am i yes. accurate there That's great. yes great. so can we have a motion to approve and contingent on the registration of all members move Oops. that thank you do we have a second second, second. oh sorry <laughs> Raise sorry. Her, lisa <laughs> lisa wins all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries thank you very much <clears throat> um, next item is regular meeting minutes of August 11th. And I have a motion to approve the minutes. So who we approve? Second. Uh, two changes. Lisa? On page one, if we could, um, not use uh, abbreviations, mm. negotiations in Mass, change that to Massachusetts, and comprehensive water plan for CON, change that to Connecticut, please. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm any abstaining. Extensions? One abstention. Thank you. Um, any reports? Subcommittee reports? Lisa. <laughs> um, thanks to Sean and Cheryl. We have begun interviewing for labor council. We've done two, and we'll schedule two more hopefully by the end of the month. Thanks to Tom for helping to coordinate those. Um, for um, Board of Ed, I wanted to let folks know that Kathy Marshall and I met with Angela Griffin to begin setting up the Senior Citizen Sports Night, so those are in the works, and we'll let you know when those dates are um, settled. From the Technology Task Force, I just wanted to give a couple quick updates. Um, 
The Center for Applied Technology will be coming in next week to begin their work evaluating the hardware software infrastructure, redundancy, projections, best practices, and disaster recovery and GIS system. They're doing a comprehensive look at our program. We work through CROG when people ask why, what's the benefit of going through CROG. They do the bidding for us and they give us a great price. So we are taking advantage of that CROG membership to use them and we've had great reviews of them. Um, the mobile data terminals for the police are going in next week. So they're excited about to get some new technology and new video cameras for dashboards are also going in um, in the next few weeks for the police department in terms of technology. We have our community of care meeting on Wednesday night and I just, um, uh, in response to a comment made at public audience, uh, we do not give personal advice uh, as when this um, committee was formed, public audience came forward and said you're going to go out talking to people and individuals and we assured everyone we would not and that remains the same. We are not there as social workers or as case workers. What we are there to is inform the community about what resources are available to them, make sure our left hand is talking to our right. To that end, um, and you will see that each member of the high school and middle school are receiving books from the community of care that talk about what drugs and alcohol are out there, what local community resources are out there for parents so that they know how to talk to their children about drugs and alcohol. And if there's an issue, what resources are available to them. At our meeting on Wednesday, we have our uh, public safety police officers are coming in to give a comprehensive review about what drugs they're seeing in the community, what parents should look for, what signs, what's out there. So it's a very informative thing. We what are getting. Is that, Lisa? I don't mean to interrupt, but in case the public wants to go, what sure, time? Sure. It's, it's six to eight at the Board of Ed main meeting room, and we um, have confirmed with um, SCTV that they will be filming it. Great. And, and if we get that done, we'll then send out a press release. Um, with the link so that parents can watch it who don't want to come. Because it's, it's good to know what's in your community, what the police do, what's out there, ask questions. It's a wonderful resource. So we are beginning to do those resources and we'll start looking about what other ways we can communicate with the community, what the schools are doing, what social services are doing. But if someone does have an issue, you can always contact social services because we do actually have social um, workers who are trained and can, um, either help the individual or refer them out. And uh, also any individual who's struggling, you know, pediatricians are a good resource as well. And if you go on our website, we do list um, local resources that are available for people struggling with substance or mental health abuse, and that's in our social services department. Thank you. Any other updates? Uh, just one quick one. The mm -hmm. Aging and Disabilities Commission sponsored the picnic in the park at St. Catharines for residents of group homes um, in Simsbury, and it was a wonderful event. It was very well attended. And I just want to thank all the volunteers from Aging and Disabilities who participated in that event. And we got so many great comments from the residents who attended and the um, staff members who came with them about how much they appreciated everything that the town and the commission did to support this event. And it was, it was a great day. And those were Simsbury residents, or were those? Yes, most of them were Simsbury, although we did extend invitations to out-of-town group home providers, and, and a lot of them attended. A lot of It was yeah. nice. It was a very... There was about 100 people, which was, was a great turnout. Thank you. I have uh, one as well. Um, the Economic Development Task Force is meeting again on September 16th. And um, as I mentioned, when Hiram was giving his presentation on economic development, we are, um, we've had some great discussions over the past few months, and we're targeting some short and long-term goals for each of the three uh, subgroups that are working. Um, and uh, to that end, at the last uh, EDC meeting, the EDC voted um, in favor of the task force moving forward to um, uh, look at an RFP for a new town website um, in combination with some of the recommendations that are coming out of the Economic Development Commission to, to really take a, um, a look at what we have, um, the way our, our uh, information is flowing on the site and its availability and, and a lot of those things. Um, as well as incorporating some branding to that too. So that will be part of that process. Um, and some other things that are um, being worked on as well as uh, professional certification for land use boards and um, some other initiatives uh, around bettering our process. So um, we've had a lot of great participation and I want to thank the volunteers who have been attending regularly and um, working diligently through this and I look forward to bringing a more comprehensive update to the board this fall. And just uh, to offer to the uh, Board of Selectmen did fund a position 
a press person to help with uh, websites, and um, I just would offer to the EDC and the task force that they uh, should meet with uh, Stephanie and that she should see what they can do internally at no cost yes. before we go out yeah. and spend she's money She's been on part of our discussion. So yes. I think she's waiting to hear, to get a meeting together to see if maybe some of the work can be done internally, so just would offer that, yep. that they get together. That would be great. Thank you. Any other um, reports? Okay. Uh, then we have two ex items for executive session. First is a discussion of uh, one Old Bridge Road. Uh, town's negotiations and update on the status of the police union pension and contract negotiations. So if we could uh, go into executive session um, and we do have staff that we would need to invite, that would be Tom Cook um, and uh, Jeff and uh, I don't think Tom, you're, you're invited to this dance. So, uh, I think that would be a <laughs> disappointment. Uh, um, so by information, uh, the town there, it is. We would adjourn from executive session, and we may take action. I don't know what the board's going to do in executive session, so I can't report whether we will or will not take action. So, um, if folks want to know, uh, we welcome you to stay. And, uh, wait for the results of the executive session. So, can I have a motion to go into executive session? Move that. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And um, Mary, I'm the far I'm 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 in again. Yep. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs>